Well, good morning. Oh. Good morning. We'll try that again. It is good to see all of you. Welcome back for our <clears throat> second day here in the Capitol on our Quality School Task Force. So um, it is good to see each of you. Um, I just kind of want to get us started and uh, go through a few things, uh, housekeeping items, if you will, um, so that we can move forward. So joining us on our um, virtual world, I've got Gary and David. So good morning. Um, just want to be sure that you guys um, are able to hear me okay. Uh, yes, Julie, I can hear you fine. This is Gary. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Gary. David, can you hear us? Okay, Emily, we're going to be uh, getting you in there right now. So um, as soon as you're able to and get promoted to being a panelist, if you could say good morning as well. Okay. Okay. Let's see, just make sure. Hmm. 
All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So I did shift one of the pieces from yesterday to today, which is to uh, identify essential attributes of school quality that enable equal opportunity. So we'll be um, engaging in an activity around that uh, to delineate an accreditation process that ensures quality and improvement and spend some time to prepare a field survey that we can put out. So what that's going to look like, um, thank you guys in, for taking some time last night to, to take a look at some data. We're going to engage in a data talk. Uh, we will uh, work on uh, what uh, an activity, if you will, on what are the essential attributes of a quality Montana school. We're going to debrief that article and kind of do a jigsaw. So uh, we'll take care of that and I hope to have all that accomplished. We will have lunch today an hour earlier, just because we're getting out at two to kind of make that adjustments. And we started today much earlier than we did yesterday. So we'll have lunch today from 11 to noon. Um, and then when we get back, we'll do a, another piece just around the accreditation process um, and be working um, to draft some field survey questions. So anticipating that piece around that, We'll kind of divide that up into groups, maybe uh, a couple of folks writing questions on the standards, a couple of people writing questions on the process, a couple of people writing questions on um, the variance to standards process or kind of what happens after and then school improvement based upon kind of how we have our framework laid out. We'll do summary and next steps. And then we do have public comments scheduled today for 15 minutes at the end from 1.45 to two. So my goal is to have you out of here today uh, by two. Um, public comment again, uh, we will be taking written comments as well. Um, so uh, if there are people online, um, uh, they can send comments to us via email uh, by 12 noon today, and then Tristan will also share those with us during public comment time. And Julie, uh, David has audio now. So David, if you want to say a quick hi, and then we also have Emily and Tony online with us now as panelists. So we have everyone connected in. Yep. Good morning, everybody. From Noxon, this is David. Hi, everyone. This is Emily. Good morning, everyone. This is Tony from Turner. Great, hey, we're glad to have all of you. So you guys, there was a big question that um, I kind of had based upon the feedback from uh, your forums yesterday. Okay, so this was a question around, how are we gonna really be able to meet our deliverables with the time that we have outlined, right? And we know time is, is one of those variables. It's very critical. So I kind of had some ideas I wanted to talk through with you a little bit to see if there's maybe some way we could structure this to buy ourselves a little bit more time or think about the time that we do have scheduled with our two hour virtual sessions and then our March meeting as well. So some of the things I was wondering about is maybe we could structure it so that by March, we have a portion off to the negotiated rule. Maybe it's half you know, um, and then another portion coming after that rather than the whole packet of um, our initial recommendation. So that was one thought. I had another thought about maybe we could add a few more to our virtual meetings and be thinking about um, some work between those meetings, maybe in some kind of uh, um, smaller groups, if you will. That was another thought I had because I do think we could subdivide so that everybody kind of has maybe with a partner, they could go much deeper on a few things and kind of structure it that way so that we kind of spread out the responsibilities um, and then come back as a whole group to kind of navigate some of that. And then I thought, well, if we do kind of think about staggering the handoff to the negotiated rulemaking committee, would we want to consider another in-person meeting in April? So these were just some of my thoughts and I wanted to talk to you guys around kind of what your thinking is, knowing that one goal we have is to get a survey out, really get some information from our stakeholders back in to inform us, and then to really be able to have some initial recommendations for the committee that talk about, this is the current rule, this is what we would recommend and why. So, um, to give you an idea, 
The task, um, let me just really quick, I'm sorry, this is thrown through these really quick. I shouldn't do that to anybody's eyes, but given the way I printed the copies on the article, I know you guys are well prepared. <laughs> these are our task force dates that we have. Um, and the only in-person one is in March versus our um, uh, negotiated rulemaking committee. Um, they're working through June. So just kind of want to open the floor on what are you guys feeling that is doable? How do you want to organize our time? How do you want to look at that schedule? What are your thoughts um, to be sure that you feel like you've got some time to do this work very thoughtfully and meaningfully? Uh, to, we want to put that out in February, and my thoughts was to have it back and collated so that in our March 8th meeting, we could really dig into it. I would suggest that um, maybe based on kind of what you shared with us this morning, that we do find another in-person time in April after the April 5th. Um, if we use it, great. If we don't, people have those days back, but I think it would be nice for all of us to at least plan to have that in case we do have work that we need to get done. Um, and then we're not scrambling to find additional time at the end. Other thoughts? This is, this is David in Knoxon. Good morning, everybody. Just a, a reminder, here in Sanders County, we have a school board election cycle that begins, actually, they can file their oath now if they choose to, in April, I mean, uh, uh, March, April, and May could be uh, months where a school board, not just our own, but a school board could see turnover in their board trustees. And, and that's just, a, I think that's only an information right now, because perhaps this task force is unaffected by it, but I just thought I'd bring that out. Uh, I'm one of one county that has elections to be held in April and May. Thank you, David. Okay, so um, I guess we could do a try out our consensus vote if you wanna give it a, give it a whirl to see if it's one that would work when we get there. And eventually, um, Eric, now that Tristan's here, if you could actually run the slides, that would be so helpful so that I don't make you all crazy the way I flip around. Um, so um, on the consensus, right, so we could take a vote. Um, so we actually have online, we have what, five people, right? Tony, David, Emily, Gary, we have four. And then five, six, seven, eight, nine, hold on. Oh, one, four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine, ten. So that's going to give us six. So we have at least six here, right? So um, that would get us to a quorum. Okay. So we added a few people. So I just need to readjust that number. Okay, you guys. So do we want to take a vote on adding an in person meeting in April like this? A, a quick point of clarification, and it goes to what David brought up. Um, should one of our board members who are representatives here um, either not be remaining on their board for any given reason. Does that preclude them from staying on this board and providing insight? Okay, thank you. All right, so does anyone want to take a motion or second a motion? Do we want to make a decision on that? Yeah, I'll make a motion that we have an April in-person meeting. All second. This is Tony from Turner. Okay, so if we could take a uh, a vote then we'll read off your name and then you have to tell us yes or no yes we want an april meeting no we do not okay uh, Bill. no yes. heather jarrett dan lee yes Right here? Yes. 
Sean. Okay, I'm moving to our people online. Emily. Yes. Gary. Yes. David. Yes. Tony. Yes. Okay, that passes unanimously. We'll take a look at the calendar over break and propose some potential dates to you all. Thank you. I sure do. All right, so just very quickly to ground ourselves again, purpose of the task force is uh, to make initial recommendations to the negotiated rulemaking committee who will make recommendations to the superintendent of public instruction who will make re um, recommendations to the board of public ed. Um, and our critical documents that we want to um, deliver on is we do want to put out a field survey um, and gather some feedback. Um, and then we need to draft a concept memorandum, which contains current rule, suggested red line rules and rationales for the decisions that we're making. So if we were tweeters today, what I'd like you to do is what tell us what you would tweet if you were tweeting out today about yesterday's work. So I put my example there. In the Montana State Capitol, considering the range of measures used to judge school quality. So I'd like everybody to give us a response. If you were to recap yesterday in a tweet, hashtag Lots of data. Hashtag um, Montana State Capitol um, working to ensure a bright future for Montana's children. David shares with us, hashtag accreditation in Montana public schools is complicated. <laughs> yes, I would add reviewing, um, revising and re Viewing, revising, and looking at quality schools. No hashtag today. <laughs> Gary. Yeah, my recap for yesterday is that I, I felt it was very well facilitated, great information, and we have a lot to consider and a lot of work to do. Um, and the <clears throat> one thought of my mind from the discussion yesterday is really, do we have a good definition and a guideline for what is quality education in the state? Right, any other thoughts recapping yesterday? About building our capacity for evaluating quality schools. I would say something like, good to be back at the Montana State Capitol, um, working to ensure quality in our public schools. 
I don't tweet. <laughs> I, yeah, social media is, is tough. Um, but I would retweet. And so many of what you said, I, I yeah, I would just, yeah. Yeah. is it a tweet or is it a twit or what is it? <laughs> <laughs> Although I enjoy reading them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyone else before we move on? Okay, thank you guys. So just before we dig in, I want you to just take a minute of just quiet time. And just kind of settle in for a second. And I want you to imagine what our schools will be like in 2033. Thank you for taking that moment for yourself. We have a few folks who need to share out with us the remaining ARM quality reports from yesterday before we dive into our data talk, okay? You did not get off the hook. <laughs> so I'm going to come back up to the poster, let Eric kind of facilitate us. So um, I know that, um, we have a few folks online who have yet to share, and I know we have a few folks still in the room that need to share. Um, and so just really quickly to kind of recap a little bit of the conversation from yesterday, uh, when I look up over here, So we had um, taken a look at the first one, which was um, 1055 710 about counselors and the staffing of the FTE for the counselors. And so it was um, thought about, is that the minimum of it, standard key to having a quality school? And it was yes, but modified. So there was quite a bit of conversation on, around that one with well, we don't know what really does happen if you have an enrollment of 127 to 399. But there was a lot of conversation about for our social workers, is there a way to build in some flexibility that there are other staffing that could provide some, some of the other support to our students kind of from that whole child beyond the FTE for the counselor, but in addition to or, or like and more and some right with some of the conversation around that so um but the thought that yes this piece is really important to a quality school is having staffing that does provide both the guidance counseling on the academic side but also a piece around the other components if you will um for for wellness so that was one piece just to kind of recap that the second one was around 1055 712 uh, classroom size. And this was again, is this the minimum standard? Key, is this minimum standard key to having a quality school? And the answer was yes, modify. Part of the conversation was that teacher quality doesn't necessarily mean or dictate. Um, you could have a teacher, the conversation was, who, who has 32 kids that could be doing an outstanding job versus you could have a classroom of 15 kids and it doesn't mean that the quality instruction is equated straight across, if you will. But there was a conversation about that is kind of important because when we think about the number of kiddos that a, um, an instructor is working with, how do they really personalize that learning to that degree with the number of kiddos that they're, they're supporting, okay? Um, and so the other piece around that was a conversation about jumpstart kindergarten and kind of some of the funding around that. So it was a conversation there. Um, and that small schools really range um, in some ways. Uh, the conversation I think was from you, Heather, was 
you know, if you are teaching um, multi-grade, say you're, you're teaching two, three, four, you're teaching uh, math, reading, uh, the social studies, the sciences, um, not only to one grade level, but to three different grade levels. And so you're really trying to personalize learning across a pretty range group, which means one does not actually equate to one in some ways when you think about the teacher load that, that, student, that our teachers have depending on the type of school that they're working in or what their caseload might be. So then moving on to ARM uh, 1055704, administrative superintendent. Uh, again, it was, is this minimum standard key to having a quality school? Is yes, modified. Um, so this was about kind of, there's some conversation about the county superintendent that many a times might be a treasure if I'm ca capturing this, this thought yesterday correctly, was around, do they really have the capacity to be providing the work that needs to be done and what role do they really play? And there was also a lot about, depending on if you're 0.25 FTE superintendent, 0 0.5, 1.0, it doesn't matter the amount of FTE you have, they still have the same number of duties that have to be completed. And so some superintendents end up doing a lot more paperwork than others just because of the makeup of their district. And so how this plays into that. Um, so the question was, do we need to add additional flexibilities based on staffing needs? So we start to see that run through you guys. We are starting to see it happen where we talked about it in the council role. Do we need flexibility in there? We're talking about it in the classroom size. Do we need flexibility in there because of um, kind of the makeup? And then we hear it again come here in the um, admin, if you will. Then uh, we capture 1055705, which is about the FTE and staffing of principals. Again, there was a question of what goes on between nine and 124 students. Does it fit the environment? Does it fit quality? Uh, their staffing demands, do we need more flexibility, allow more, um, I'm sorry, I can't even read my own writing. <laughs> oh, maybe take, having more staff take part, uh, how do we really ensure this, um, that we really do feel that these folks need to be trained, that they need to understand um, teaching and learning, and that it's really important that, that we have these folks um, and that they really understand that role. Um, so that was kind of that thought there. And then the 1055708 teaching assignment, appropriately, appropriately assigned K-8 teacher. Um, would it be possible for a K-8 teacher because they are licensed to also play the role of a library media specialist? So again, there was some conversation around, you know, um, if you will, um, the teaching assignment and some flexibility there. And then the last one that we covered yesterday was 1055704 on PD. Um, so uh, questions around this, yes. This one actually was, the, um, was in yes, um, was about uh, does it promote quality? They feel uh, it's put here that it's one of the most important um, and that it contributes also to renewal units for uh, folks to keep their licenses and renew their licenses. Um, and it's been um, that it's really important uh, for us as a group to take a look at the crossover of this particular arm with House Bill 246 about job embedded shadowing as a mechanism for professional development. So anything you guys want to add to what I just kind of captured here of our conversation from yesterday before we dig into the ones we didn't get to. I can. I, it is, I can it start is uh, suggesting you guys again to um, mm. virtual. <laughs> <laughs> and to in person. John, go ahead. Thanks. Okay. Um, I have uh, ten dot fifty five dot nine zero two, and it is on <clears throat> basic education for um, middle school, so middle grades. And so it's talking about basic programming, such as uh, appropriate instruction, scheduling, teaching a variety of ways, uh, undertake in interdisciplinary work, plan blocks of coursework. Some of the minimum requirements are around 
making sure you have ELA, math, physical, life sciences, social studies, and life or health enhancement, enhancement, and then um, some other minimums um, that they want or that to maintain in this um, arm is visual arts, music, CTE, world languages. And then on top of it, uh, the last minimum requirement is coming up with, with electives that um, students can take. And so uh, I feel like, I feel yes, this is a, this is a piece to quality um, education, but it, I think it needs to be, I mean, looking at those requirements, I think we can continue to keep talking about what could be modified in, in that as well. Um, I think one of the big pieces, I guess, that is uh, dependent on each school is when you do look at those electives, what electives are you offering and how many staff members do you have that can do those uh, electives as well? So I know that really goes, gets into scheduling, how many FTE you have on site to be able to offer that. And it gets into a game, especially when you are, budgets are tight and, or you're in a small school, it turns into a game of Jenga. And so whether you pull one during a certain time, it makes it very, very difficult. So your larger schools obviously are gonna have a lot more offerings and electives than your smaller schools. So I think there is a inequity piece within middle school offerings and high school and primary too, but pertaining to this one specifically, that's, I guess those are my two cents. So what else? Uh, th this is Gary. C can I make a comment, Julie? Go ahead, Gary. Okay. Yeah, just one thought on this discussion and looking back at yesterday is um, the, the ARM standards, we're always talking about the, the minimum or the baseline. And I'm just curious if, if you know, given your question of what schools are going to look like in 2033, I'm wondering if we should also be looking at what are some realistic goals for every district to achieve? Um, and would something like that give us a better idea of what we envision a quality education to be? So, and I don't know if that fits in here, but it just seems like you know, if we were able to identify some very reasonable, maybe maybe lofty goals, but they they certainly would provide quality education, and all the educators in the state knew what that was. Um, would that be helpful? So, just just a thought. Gary, this is John Conan again. I totally agree with you. Um, I actually going to throw Emily Dean out there if she'll maybe speak to it, but that's something that that uh, Montana School Board Association has been pushing is this transformational learning and coming up with all the flexibilities that uh, I think we're going to need to start taking a look at. It isn't 10 years down the road. It, it is coming up. Sorry to throw you out there, Emily, but I know I've been in a lot of sessions recently this last year with, with MTSBA. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, thank you. Uh, we, that's, Something that I would say MTSB in particular, but with all of the MTPEC partners um, are definitely in a similar space, um, particularly on the heels of HB 246. Um, I, it's funny when I looked at the the slide that Julie showed um, of you know what will schools be like in 2023, and um, I think what we sometimes forget is that. Right now, we are preparing students for jobs that don't yet exist and jobs that, you know, may not actually be located in Montana, even though they live here. Um, and I think one of the things that's come out of the pandemic um, is that you can still have a Montana lifestyle and you can have a job now that, you know, even when I was graduating from high school, I didn't think, you know, you could have without leaving the state. Um, and that opens up a whole new wor world for our students, but it also means that they have to be immensely more prepared um, for that, whether that be 
you know, something that requires higher education or, um, you know, they are designing software processes to manufacture, you know, aerospace parts. Um, so yes, we have, I would say that I don't necessarily know if we need goals outlined in ARM because I would not be doing my job and I can hear Lance in my head saying, <laughs> uh, ARM, they are, they are the baseline. They are the, the, the guideposts. Um, however, I think ensuring that what we do here really provides the flexibility for any school to provide, you know, a whole new world of opportunities for students is what is probably most critical um, and that we are not creating arbitrary boundaries that prohibit further innovation. I don't know if that answers your question, but something to think about. Um, and I do know there's a number of you who are on this call who are also part of the um, K-12 vision project um, that really does provide the, those are the loftier goals, the things that we want to see in the next, it's a, it's a strategic plan over the next five to 10 years um, of what education will look like in Montana. Um, so I don't know if you have any other questions, but I hope that answer is kind of what you were getting at. Great, thank you, Emily. I saw Dan, your finger was poised over your microphone there. For a second. I think there's a tension when I read this, this particular um, standard, we have this tension that, um, how specific should we be? Because we have this variety of schools across our state with um, a variety of capacities to achieve, to meet these requirements. And if it becomes, a, a, a game of how can I figure out that in a one room schoolhouse, I'm doing all of these things and I'm doing units and one person is doing it. it, it you know what I mean? It's uh, I'm not sure how helpful that is. So I think we need to be careful that these standards aren't so prescriptive that it strangles local school districts from their ability to, to do what they want to do with their students. I mean, this is a this is an issue for me and personally. Um, local school districts should have some authority in determining how, what their schools look like, and this. But the state has a duty to ensure there's an equitable and quality program. So this is tension, right? So um, when I see something like one let one unit English language arts, one unit social studies, one unit mathematics, one unit science, and so on. Um, they're not earning credits for high school. This is middle grades. And so I wonder, well, why would we, why would we want to be so prescriptive in that? And there are a number of them like that, that I've seen. So I'm just, I'm just tossing it out as a, a, a just for food for thought. I would like to, I agree with you, Dan. And what comes to mind for me is that even though we look at that transformational learning and what a classroom would look like from that picture, that's not necessarily saying what our, schools on our reservations and how they want to hold on to their cultural heritage and they're actually striving harder to carry through their traditions and maintain that and so we need to always be open and allow for flexibility for them to carry on their traditions on in the reservation schools and i think that's extremely important with local control and the community having a say Thank you. Good discussion. So I think you guys I just want to you're bringing up a really big tension point and I just want to kind of highlight it and put a light on it because we're going to have to wrestle with it. And it's this notion of the tension between the minimum quality standards and this idea of expectations and flexibility to get there. So we hear it ranging from in your conversation around, well, what's it mean with the transformational learning? What does it mean about preparing students for jobs that yet do not exist? What does it mean for a K-12 vision? What does it mean for standards not to be so prescriptive 
Um, and how do we ensure that there is the ability and the authority at the local level to determine what is needed for that community in context? And then Billy adds on a very important point around our tribal schools of the tribal influence of, of um, uh, preserving and enhancing the culture and language um, in their schools as well and being sure that there's flexibility for them to achieve that. Um, and so I call your attention to a, just a portion of that article that I gave you last night, because I think it really captures this tension point, okay? Um, and so it's on page 11. And I'm just gonna read it to you to just put a note here for us as a group. And then we'll continue on with our other rules. And, and when after you're done with that, Emily has her hand raised. Yeah. And so I think that you guys, this is bringing up this tension point. That's really something that's there. Um, so um, this is under the paragraph that says opportunities for coherence in ARM. In education policy, the concept of coherence generally refers to the alignment and coordination between different policies and rules. Researchers and policy experts have written about the importance and impact of coherence for many years. Indeed, the standards-based reform movement that began in the late 1980s and culminated in the passage of No Child Left Behind was meant to support greater coherence. In the 1993 volume, Designing Content Educational Policy, Susan Furman wrote about different theories of action, driving the push towards coherence, including, and this is the quote, if states set ambitious expectations for students, and coordinate instructional policies around those expectations, they would also undertake reforms to provide a great deal of freedom to schools in reaching these out, those outcomes. Minimal standards regulations that currently make up much of educational policy would be removed or revised so as not to restrict flexibility. State instructional policies would be sufficiently explicit so as not to be vague but not so detailed that they would dictate day-to-day -day curriculum or pedagogy. However, the result of the work that policies meant to enable coherence, learning standards and assessments ended up being added to existing policies thus making the problem worse. This manifests in Montana by the fact that schools are not just held accountable to a set of learning standards, as was the intent of standards-based reform, but are held accountable to performance standards, content standards, and program standards. So I just leave that there. I know that Emily has her hand up and then um, I just think we're highlighting this tension point of the theory of action behind the different movements, if you will, and the standards-based movement in the 1980s versus what we're seeing today which is much more transformational and personalized. Emily? Thanks, yeah. One thing I was just going to add, I think that in Montana, we actually don't get as much credit as we probably deserve for being ahead of the curve. I think part of it is just because it takes a little longer for folks to um, maybe decide to implement it widely. Um, but once, once they do, it's very successful. But one thing that within MCA that, goes exactly to the point that, and I'm not sure who had said it in the room, so I apologize, um, ensuring that we're actually meeting students where they are. Um, the Indian School Board Caucus was very instrumental in passing um, transformational learning and advanced opportunities in the 2019 session. And that those two bills are really what set the stage for HB 246. And within um, 351, which is the transformational learning bill, um, it it defines transformational learning as um, an ed as developing the full edu educational potential of each pupil that one is customized to address each pupil's strengths, needs, and interests. Two includes fo continued focus on each pupil's proficiency over content, and three actively engages each pupil in determining what, how, when, and where each pupil learns. And then to build on that, in three eighty seven. It's one of my most favorite lines of the entire bill, um, and it's under section two, which is the purpose and intent. Um, and 2D um, 
says provide, and, and this is the, the intent part, provide expanded flexibility to districts in supporting each pupil's post-secondary success path to align with each pupil's individual interests, passions, strengths, needs, and culture. I, I don't believe that you can have personalized learning that's not culturally relevant because students are not going to connect with the content or with their learning environment um, and therefore see, you know, whatever kind of future they want for themselves. So I think all of these things are very, very closely intertwined and um, we have plenty of a basis within MCA um, to help build out the arm in a manner that still respects um, the local control of, of districts and, and giving them the room to really flourish um, while also providing these guideposts to help us lead us to you know, this 2033 vision. Thank you, Emily, and good discussion. Um, let's see, I think we might, I'm not sure if David had a chance to present yet, uh, present his chunk of the arm, and then is there anyone else in the room? And John, all oh, right, you, <laughs> okay. Okay, all right. Uh, David, are you, would you be ready to go next or should- Yes. We Okay. Yes, I'm okay. Good morning, everybody. You tell us I've, which uh, the arm you have. Yep. I'm, I'm going to be talking about and asking questions about the uh, 1055904. Uh, I'm going to be doing, well, hold on. No, 905. I apologize. 905 graduation requirements. And I'm going to be thinking out loud and I'm going to be asking patience from everybody because I feel that as I understand everything right now, this is not required for the assurance uh, standard for a Montana quality public school. Uh, I'm looking at it and, and that's why I need your, you folks help. I'm looking at the current standards right now accreditation status criteria reference guide. And I do not see the word graduation in either accreditation status or performance, assurance status or uh, student performance standards, except as the high school graduation rate. So I would suggest that the language that we currently see in 905 is just simply not required. Uh, there's a number of things that got my attention, and we've already began talking about it this morning with the flexibilities that the Montana legislature has allowed the local school boards to participate in. And with that flexibility, the local school board and, and of course, the administration team has an opportunity to eliminate the Carnegie unit completely to absolutely get away with it. And so the 20 units of credit for graduation will become antiquated and, and not required. And then there's the, uh, there's the, uh, uh, the, the, the language that says content specific grade level learning progression. If indeed the school board determines that mastery and proficiency will will be the driving factors in our curriculum there will be no need to keep a student within a content specific grade level learning pro progression they would go through the curriculum approved by the board at their pace and once the mastery and the proficiency is mastered they will they will indeed move on with no regard for number of days at one level or another and then somebody else has already mentioned this morning, four units of English, two units of math, two, all, all of that stuff. I'm not sure where it all came from, but it, in today's legislation available to Montana public schools, all of those unit requirements aren't needed now. And they're not relevant because the school board can determine that no, our learning objectives for English are as follows, and, and they're not bound to spend time in English language arts for the next four years of their student life. 
And so a lot of this activity, if I understand what we're doing correctly, in the school district of 2033, none of this will, will be, will be a, a part of a, a school district's activities. Uh, in accordance with the policies of the local school board of trustees, students may be graduated from high school with less than four year enrollment. So this particular, uh, this particular standard for quality schools is already dancing around what is more likely to happen here in the very near future. Students will be able to move through a uh, high school curriculum at their own pace. And I believe that the word graduation is going to become something, something of a capstone event for individual students. I, I suggest that a senior class graduating on May the 27th as a whole will become a social event, not, not an academic event. And so uh, I know this seems kind of random and it probably is not realistic, but except for the ESSA requirement where the federal government wants to know our graduation rate and except for the student performance of our current, uh, our current uh, appraisal for accreditation in the state of Montana, I just simply do not see value or relevance going forward for graduation requirements. Thank you, David. So, David, uh, so uh, to David's point, um, we have this because of the Committee of Ten that was formed in 1892, which consisted of presidents of 10 major colleges, University of Michigan, Harvard, and so on, who, when brought together, decided what the secondary curriculum should look like. So this is 1892, all right? So, you know, we have had some changes in that. We don't teach Greek anymore, but still history, English, science, the Latin quadrivium is, has been done for years in our country. And to David's point, I'm not sure it's, it's bad or good. I'm just saying it, it's pretty arbitrary. That, that's all I'm saying. It was, an arb, it was an arbitrary decision based on 10 presidents of major universities a long time ago. And if I, and if I understand correctly, certainly in our case, we require 26 of these Carnegie units for a student to graduate. And yet the accreditation standard requires only 20. So I suspect that many school districts in one way or another probably don't adhere to this particular standard anyway. So David, um, yeah, you, you meet the state minimum, which is 20 and you move above that to 26. In my school district, do we do 23? An example would be Butte, Butte does 20. Um, and so what this just states is the minimum standard. Um, to your point, I think that 906, which I don't know if we're discussing 906, but 906 is where it outlines the unit of credit is defined by, defined by those minutes, the Carnegie unit that you're discussing. And I think maybe that's something we need to look at because it's not discussed, which I thought was interesting because it is discussed in middle school, but it's not discussed in high school, it's its own section. Um, 904 and 905 don't define what a unit is. And so as it's written, there's no definition for how those can be given the time for which a student can progress through that at their own pace. Some students need less, but I know a lot of students who need more time to be able to master, especially things like reading and basic math. Um, but 906 is where we address that. So I think we need to bounce to 906 as well eventually and look at that. And maybe that's where our definition of what true proficiency versus just seat time becomes. And I wanna kind of bounce off of something that Heather just said that um, I think makes a lot of sense. And it's something that I continuously have to have conversations with legislators about that this is the minimum. There are many school districts that go above this that require more um, units to be offered or required to graduate. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention um, that 
David kind of talked a little bit about is that I do think that um, a diploma matters. We've had a lot of conversations with people about diploma versus high set, especially those in say our youth challenge um, or you know other alternative programs. Um, and we hear from the field and the workforce that diplomas matter. So I do think that graduation does still mean something um, and that getting that diploma is important both for our students, but for workforce as well. Yes, and, and I would agree. I think the families want a graduation. I, obviously the federal government wants a graduation so they can gauge our, our, our academic success. But in the future, what will the term graduation look like in Montana public schools? Will it be a capstone event in the gymnasium that families enjoy? Or will it be an accreditation standard that must be accomplished by the Montana School District? Great. Thank you, David. You definitely uh, opened up a rich vein here. So, and filled up a whole chart in the room here. So, thank you. Okay. I know, John, you have a couple. Um, I don't know if you're ready to go or Dan, whichever of you, and then uh, Billy over here. So I, I think everyone online had a chance to present yesterday, right? I think Emily went. Did Tony go? Yeah. Tony went first and then you heard from yeah. I think I did, I did not go, but I don't necessarily need to. <laughs> oh, no, we, we, we for, hear <laughs> we'll hear from you. <laughs> Okay, but while we're here in the room, why don't we, uh, whoever would like to go, Billy, John, or Dan. All right, uh, we had one similar yesterday to this one. This is 10.55.704, Administrative Personnel Assignment of District Superintendents, and it deals with a curriculum coordinator or curriculum director. So. It states school systems with 100 or more FT licensed staff shall employ a full time curriculum coordinator to supervise the educational program and align standards assessment curriculum instruction and instructional materials. The coordinator shall hold a class three license and those districts with fewer than 100 um, and no full time coordinator must use a consortium or multi district collaborative interlocal cooperative part time or or designated curriculum director so it's interesting as you go up in classifications. Um, from C to B to A, A is kind of split. There's um, curriculum directors are kind of split between some other positions, usually at the at the class A level. Not very many districts have a designated uh, curriculum coordinator. Some class A schools have um, uh, a cooperative that they use a curriculum coordinator for. And then once you get double A, obviously everyone has a has has a curriculum coordinator. So that's just a little background. I think that when I've done research into this. Um, because uh, we we currently are the only school in the in our valley out of seven schools that has a designated curriculum coordinator. Um, so does this define quality? Um, and it goes back to the person I guess you hire, obviously. But uh, I, I definitely think uh, that that number, if we're really focusing on instruction, right? Um, this curriculum coordinator should be helping support that piece. So um, I do think yes, it is a definition of quality. Um, one piece in there that um, I don't know if we want to offer flexibility for it or not, or suggest that is the licensure piece of an admin, um, getting your admin endorsement to be able to be a curriculum coordinator. Um, I guess I've been around some, some pretty fantastic teachers that could jump right into that role, but I understand the, the administrative piece of it, especially as you get into class A and, and double A, you're dealing with, you know, upwards of 100 teachers, then you need someone to coordinate those, those, uh, especially new new standards reviews, right. And um, that's not their only job, but that's a major portion of their job. Um, and getting those teams and getting teachers involved in that. Um, so I guess yes, with modifications and looking at uh, if we were to look at that piece of it, um, I guess I, I'm, 
don't know what that looks like to, to define more quality within this arm. Again, go back to what Emily said, this is the, this is the minimum and um, people who design this, you go back and think when they design this, what do they want for a minimum, right? Well, is there anything we can add to that minimum? I don't, I don't know. So I'll, I'll just leave it there. Questions, discussion? Anybody have the history or the background of why the curriculum coordinators need the admin endorsement? Because there are curriculum endorsements out there as well, which I think would be better fitting for that. So perhaps Dr. Lee, you may. You know, that's a great question, Heather, because I think I've struggled with, we only require one curriculum course in the master's program. Mm -hmm. So um, you hardly ever leave for principal licensure with any kind of real background curriculum, except kind of a general basic overview. Um, I've long thought that we ought to offer advanced degrees in teacher leadership, which would be a, like a hybrid 50% uh, leadership with 50% curriculum. So I, I don't think that just having an administrative license makes you a curriculum expert currently. Certainly I'm not. I, I hear you, Dan. Um, obviously I'm not gonna speak for Great Falls, but that's where I was previously to this position. And uh, we had uh, instructional coaches too. And those instructional coaches, um, man, help drive a lot of our implementation and um, work for our curriculum. Again, it's a kind of a similar question, right, that you guys are bringing up, which is what's the role or the intention behind the position? And is this the only way to meet that need? Because it could be teacher leaders. It could be instructional coaches. That's what I hear you saying, right? And I don't know what the intention is, but sometimes I feel like when you look at some of the school sizes, right, when you look at that staffing model, it might have been matched somewhat up with administration because somebody might be playing both roles. Or if they have that, they have somebody with that administrative role as well that can help. I don't know, but it does make you wonder, right? What was the intention behind what it was trying to drive towards as that minimum standard? Um, and again, questions around, is that the only way to meet what the intention or purpose of the role is? There should be um, some flexibility in that smaller schools maybe have something like an advisory curriculum committee or something like that, where you show that you have a group of people working towards the same purpose. Um, because in a smaller school district, um, it does get tagged on with the administrator as the point whatever FTE, or it's consortium connected, but the responsibilities and the duties still fall on the teachers, not on that person because it just can't. So I think that maybe looking at a committee approach within there might be flexible. All right, one last piece. Um, there is so much administrivia <laughs> to that management piece of it, because you have to, obviously as a district, you have to um, be able to communicate everything you're doing to your public. So um, all the paperwork and all the stuff you have to do as a curriculum coordinator to get all your stuff online for parents to be able to, to view what the uh, you know, possible curriculum is to meet those standards. And then just the fact of going in and reviewing all the content standards that change uh, every five years when you do your review, um, I, I, I guess I understand why there's a lot of, <laughs> there's someone designated to it and I, and, but I, I do think, I think you're right. I think we do need to have some of those flexibilities with, with that, um, piece of, of getting teachers involved, especially in smaller schools. We just had a request for clarification uh, about which arm we were talking about. It's uh, 704 part two. Where it talks about the curriculum coordinator. Okay. So one of the thing is when I think about curriculum coordinators, I think, what are we, what are we coordinating? The curriculum, right? Which is knowledge. So, 
you know, in 1900, we doubled our knowledge like every 100 years. In 1945, we did it like every 25 years. Now it's somewhere around 13 months. Mm -hmm. So when you think about how much we are generating knowledge at any given time and thinking about high school, going back to David's point, high school course of study, is, is curriculum coordinates really have to be flexible. I mean, we're, what do our kids study? And there's a lot to study, right? So um, it's not as easy as putting fences around things like we used to do. So I think curriculum coordinators really, it's a, it's a whole different role now. Okay. All right. Thank you, John. Someone like to go next. Sure. Okay. Dan will go. All right. So I have um, 907 distance online and technology delivered learning. Kind of interesting. If you bear in mind, this was written in 2013. We're in, we're almost in 2023. And so 10 years later, and this to me, when I first read it, seemed like, well, it's pretty like up to date, well, you know, up to date arm, you know. Um, basically, it, it just it says that if you're going to, if a school district is going to deliver online learning, they need, it needs to be done by a licensed um, teacher in that area of study. And Montana or another state, they, they have to be licensed. And in the, at the site, you would have to have a facilitator. So if the teacher were certified, were licensed, the facilitator doesn't need to be, they could be a parapro. But if the teacher delivering the material um, was not in their area, you would have to have a licensed person on site. So what the purpose of this arm is ensuring that our kids have a, a licensed individual who is helping them learn that material. So to that degree, I'd say it does guarantee a modicum of quality. Um, so uh, yeah, so I, I would say to the extent we require licensure, it doesn't say anything about content, but it says we, with respect to life. So I think being licensed is one quality measure. So, so this is David. What, as I read this, and then I try to, to understand the, uh, the current situation in Montana teaching licensure that is currently going on right now. Will this arm as it currently reads be in conflict or in compliance with the teacher licensing that is about to be submitted to the BPE? Do, will they match up? I understand that we're gonna have far more flexibilities soon in teacher licensing. And will this particular arm uh, put boundaries on remote learning? David, this is Julie. Um, I believe that they're, they're in alignment between uh, what's in 57 for teacher licensure okay. uh, uh, with it as it currently sits. Um, so when we're talking about licensure and certification, Yes, um, I could say that. But in terms of like remote learning, I think that's a, um, a common misunderstanding, if you will, that distance learning is not the same as remote learning because distant learning is basically um, uh, apart from the school. It's not current staff, teach, well, it could be current staff, but it's, it's distant from the learning, which is remote is just a, a, a form of learning that we, we have switched to when we have to um, say, okay, we're not gonna be doing our learning today um, in the class, we're gonna do it remotely, but it's the same group of students, the same school. Um, and so it's not considered distant learning, if you will. And remote learning can happen asynchronous and synchronous as well. But um, I just wanna specify that these two things are in definition different. Okay, Dan, anything else um, about 907 that stood out to you or any other thoughts from our other participants? 
that 10 years ago, we thought this was pretty normal. It's pretty common now. And <laughs> special arm to cover if you're licensed to teach or not. I mean, if we're talking about the mode of teaching, whether it be online or face to face, it's still teaching. So I question whether we even need this arm or not. But thank you, Dan. Okay, should we take a turn with one of our online folks? So I think we still have David or Emily. Just Emily? Okay. Emily, would you be willing to go next? Yep. Um, so I had 709 Library Media Services, K-12. Um, I One thing that was really interesting, I just did some very brief research, so it wasn't very in depth, but we fall in about um, the middle of the pack nationwide in terms of um, the library and media specialist to um, student ratio nationwide, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, one, and that was, I had found that from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Um, one thing that I could not find though, um, but I did not go very deep into um, many of the resource databases was if there has been much research around like what is the ideal um, ratio, like what students really need to be successful. Um, so that's something I think I will spend some time actually looking into because I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, within the ARM, um, I'd be interested in knowing if anyone has any idea on the history of where the, the numbers came from. So half an FTE for schools with 126 to 250 students um, and, and on from there. I don't know if those were just kind of round numbers that were picked out um, when the arm was updated um, anytime previously, but I am going to ask around about that. I know that sometimes in other pieces of arm, you know, it all, it's numbers that are negotiated amongst parties, but it'd be interested to know if anyone has any idea. Um, one thing though that did come up when I was doing a little bit of research is um, some additional pieces that had come out from a few think tanks about um, the increasing importance of um, school librarians in general, particularly during the pandemic and what that means moving forward. Um, a, a lot of the thoughts that were in some of the pieces um, were more or less that, um, you know, students, need the ability to evaluate sources on their own um, and that librarians really do provide um, that type of context for students while also um, a, a couple of them were interesting that you know each generation continues to have more careers so right now the average millennial um, is estimated to have 12 careers in their lifetime and the ability to move between careers and have the resources to um, understand how to move careers is something um, that's not necessarily taught in a content, um, but something that could be provided through someone who teaches, you know, resource gathering. Um, so that was really interesting. I don't have any specific thoughts on like changes because I do think that having some more research would be helpful, but I am very anxious to see if I can kind of dig into where those um, numbers came from in terms of, um, you know, how many FTEs per group of students. Emily, I think your questions are really good. Um, this is McCall. I actually had a conversation with, um, Representative Anderson, who is the chair of the Variances to Standards Board on Monday, because he was here for the interim committee. And he had, um, we were talking specifically about library media because it is, as we talked about yesterday, like one of the only things that seems that they review. Um, and he had suggested maybe getting 
more information from the variances to standards board kind of as some feedback for us um because it is people it's a group of people who have done this for some time um so that was something that that we had talked about and he had suggested that maybe this committee um potentially look at adding gray areas in between some of these really hard numbers um, to offer some school districts more flexibility. I would advocate for, and I have some letters actually from some of our members, is that we look at that, especially that 126 number and look at some gray area there or maybe a rolling average over three to five years or something so that they're not going from year to year with not meeting it and meeting it and back and forth, particularly when the deadline for variances is, I think, coming up real soon here in March, and they may not know their enrollment, um, but they know families moving in or out or things like that. So maybe to look at, like you said, that hard number and if there's some gray there for us. My concern uh, with this is when I looked at the data, 51 of the 56 variances were around this yeah. topic. So that tells me statistically that we're not meeting the needs of our public schools in Montana. We have to look differently, different at this to be sure that we can meet the needs. And I looked also at the classifications. I broke them down. Um, are they class AA? Are they class A? Are they B? Are they C? And the biggest chunk of them is right in the middle. It's the A's and the B's. There's a couple C's, one double A. And so it really is that middle chunk. Um, and so I think we have a lot of work to do on this one. It, uh, I'd like to know how we define media, because I think when this was written, I interpreted it as technology and media and media and all the platforms that that um, writing comes in. But really, what do our librarians do outside? I mean, what's their job description and does that meet the definition? Probably teacher prep, licensure. I mean, there's it's all of those channels feeding into that. Yeah. First, I want you to know I love libraries. What I'm about to say it shouldn't. But um, if we're talking about where we're going to be 10 years from now, I mean, increasingly, I see at the university level, fewer and fewer students inside a building called a library because they all have computers. And so when they need something, they just look it up. They don't go to the library and go to the card catalog and walk up on the fifth floor. You know how, you know how that goes. We don't do that much anymore, and we still and we you know it's important we have print media for kids. I think it's important, but um, I don't think it's I, I I don't I know we're having this recorded, but I don't think it's critical that we have a a person who knows the Dewey Decimal System. I mean, it's important if you're going to have a fairly large library. Don't uh, don't get me wrong, but for a lot of small libraries, it's a matter of organizing the library. And being around when kids take books out and reading to them, especially in elementary school. So a teacher, I think, could do that sort of thing. So maybe the standards are different for high school than they are for, say, K-8, which would kind of make sense to me. So um, the Ameri I was looking at the American Libraries Association website, but my guess is those numbers come historically from some library association that said this is... This is what we think the optimal ratio is. It's kind of like the nurse association saying, you know, how many, you know. So that's my guess where it all came from. But I'm not, I'm not sure we need it the way it's structured now. One resource I'd really um, encourage folks to look at too, um, the, um, sorry, the National School Library Standards um, from the American Association of School Librarians um, focus really critically their their kind of foundation is inquire um, or inquiry um, and then it breaks it down um, to like growth creating sharing um, thinking etc but their standards I found were actually pretty interesting and I did not realize um, how specific they were um, but we very much encourage everyone to take a look at those. So this, uh, this is another rich topic and uh, has a lot of intersections with previous conversations. So kind of looking at Julie, because I know we had talked at one point about possibly 
subcommittees um, or it sounds like there might be people who could help us with this, maybe the variance to standards boards. Uh, Emily shared some research, maybe some folks want to dig deeper into this topic uh, because we know there's so much around that. So I'm trying to think if there's any next specific next steps here that any of us in this room or people yeah, we've talked um, to. I don't think that we have that established yet. And I, I think we want to be really thoughtful around how we would even begin to look at focus groups and what we'd be focusing on, because I both want to, as I've told you guys, when zoom in and we want to zoom out, right? And so we can zoom into one in particular like this, right? But underneath it, there's something bigger, right? And it is about this tension point between, again, what is minimum standard and really what are the student expectations? When we think about the library media specialist, for an example, I hear Emily saying, well, there's an intention behind what they're supposed to be delivering. So where's the flexibility? Does that mean the intention is only to have a, a library specialist at this point to 5.50, 1.0? What is it that we're actually asking of them to do aligned to with the, the view of 2033, right? As what Dan is saying is even the role and, and kind of how kids are engaging with it has been evolving. And it's a resource and we're thinking about all of that. So I would say, I'm not sure, Eric, that I wanna go into taking one particular arm yet. I think we, gotta, we got to drill down to better understand what's happening underneath these so that we can zoom back up. Does that make sense? So that we can kind of start to structure what is it that we're intending to do if we're to make a recommendation? Is it just to remove it? Or is it to actually talk about What's the intention behind uh, this and where's some flexibility? So I just kind of put a pause there to say, I'm not sure that we're at a place where um, I think we all need to just start taking one piece and diving deep into it, if you will. Fair enough. And I just want to validate people's instincts of going out and, you know, talking to people and uh, gathering resources. And if, if the comp center can help gather some information that would illuminate this topic or others. We're happy to. Yeah, and I think that's part of the purpose of the survey and part of a purpose of an activity that I'm going to have in your inbox on the 31st is for you all to, to figure out um, how we could go do some conversations, if you will, with some of these key stakeholders. So maybe someone's going to be tasked on the 31st with hosting some conversations with Mr. Anderson from the um, variance to standards board to learn what kind of standards are people seeking because as Heather's mentioned on this particular one right 50 out of 51 of the requests for variance to standards are for this which then says are we meeting the need then if this is the place where so many people are seeking some sort of flexibility so I think that we'll have to think thoughtfully about and that's kind of what I, I hope to kind of walk away with today is an understanding of how this group, once we leave here, the work doesn't stop, but actually gets going even quicker and faster and how you get out into the field and have some of those critical conversations with our stakeholders. So I um, hear you and I, I, I value that. And I think that is a very important piece. And um, as McCall has mentioned, right? Or others have mentioned, John even mentioned that I think yesterday about you know, superintendents, right? at some of the mass meetings. So I think we're gonna to have to think about that as what is our next task when we walk away from here before we come back together with that idea in mind. Great, okay. So I think we just have two more. John, I think had a second one and Billy. And I think we're- I am done. I had curriculum and coordinator and I had middle school. Okay, all right. So maybe it's just Billy. So I have um, 801 school climate, and I believe the school climate is very important, um, especially in our day and age. Um, however, I do feel that this specific arm is a little too pres prescriptive, and I do feel that there are overlapping pieces that are already stated in other arms. So if you look at, for example, um, subsection C, that has its own specific arm and opportunity in um, 802. So we're restating it again. Um, 
I think that there are some important parts in here, like the policies and procedures with bullying, intimidation, harassment that need to stay. Um, section B talks about creating teaching and learning conditions that meet the goals and recruitment and maintain a quality staff. And what came to mind there is um, the process of accreditation. If it tags a, a school of being, of not meeting the standards, then that is really hard to, um, it, it plays against each other in my opinion, to recruit quality staff. I think that the parent involvement is extremely important, but I think that's seen in different ways and not necessarily just under school climate. I think that's under our programs as well. So I guess more than anything, I do believe that this is part of a quality school, this arm. However, I feel that it's a little bit repetitive and that some of these should be placed in different areas. Thoughts on this arm from others? There are nuances to tease out. It's about school climate, but school climate is about feeling safe at school, right? So I think that's important. Um, feeling supported. Yeah, there's a lot of, it sounds soft, I know, but I think school climate is soft. And so I'm not sure this whole arm captures what a real authentic school climate is. Definitely, I'm right along with you, Dan. I think um, looking in the last 10 years, um, and for you, for those of you that have been in education for more than 10 years, um, we've always thought about school culture being a part of what our job is and should be everyone on campus. But I think just in this last decade and more so in the last three or four years, it's really highlighted the fact of how much more school culture drives um, what we do every day. And um, I'm a huge Dr. Bill Daggett fan where he talks about the fact that um, when he did his research this last decade, he found out the top 1% of the top 1% of schools all have the top performing schools in the US all have one thing in common and they all have a strong school positive culture. And so um, I, at the end of my emails, I answer my, my, my tagline is um, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I, I just feel like within culture, um, there's a high accountability piece. And a lot of times when people talk about having a good um, school culture, uh, accountability sometimes is left out, but it's a huge piece of it. And um, I think we need to, along with mental health, I mean, those are, those are my two things that I, I feel like are, are huge pieces that um, I think we need to address in my opinion. And this goes right along with it, what, what you said, Billy, thank you. I know that you were uh, reluctant to have a subcommittee, but if we were going to have a subcommittee, this would be a, a great subcommittee. What school culture, school climate, what is, what is a positive school climate? What's a positive school culture look like? And then put that in on. And I think too, that um, the role of distance as education and online education needs to be a part of this as well. And that's not in here. Well, and it's interesting to me that this starts with the local board of trustees shall, and it doesn't address any of the other entities that actually put the pieces in place. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. I think we got, did everyone get to go? Did we miss someone? Okay, 
So a couple of, uh, as we said, On you guys, is this the minimum standard key to having a quality school? So we took a took a look at literally fifteen individual um, arms to try to really unpack that and drill down and say right. But in that process, what we learned, I believe, if I'm capturing your thinking, what we learned through this activity is, what does this really mean? when we say minimum standard, and why is there such a tension point with that, with this notion over here of what really are our goals that we wanna achieve? What really are our expectations for students? What is transformational learning? Knowing that we're preparing students for jobs that don't exist yet, where they'll have 12 careers in their lifetime, that standards are prescriptive. And um, they're limiting schools. And why is that not living with the local school board or with our tribal nations that they're able to really kind of kind of um, bring forward the schools that they want to see happen for their kiddos uh, to extend culture and language? So there's a tension point here. And so I think this activity has highlighted that of what really is the intention of these arms, okay? If it is to define quality, what do we really mean by that? Right, because it's based upon a standards movement from the 80s, you guys. And it's very much driving the staffing and budgeting of schools. And is it giving them the flexibility and latitude to innovate towards this future vision or the current vision of the things that we, we know are in front of us? Okay, so I'm gonna give you a break if that sounds good, <laughs> leave you with that, take a break. Uh, and uh, if I'm looking at the clock here, I've got us at 9.30. How about we're back at 9.40, 10 minute break. Um, and when we get back, we're going to um, dive into a data talk. So when you get back, kind of get organized, get out your data and your responses to your question. But before you run on break, we do have a guest in the room. And so I do want her to be able to just greet you and say hello. Deputy Allen. Good morning, And to reach that aspiration that each and every one of us have for the top quality schools, not in the nation anymore, because we compete globally. As you well know, we have teachers in Montana that come here internationally. We know that we've got students that are filling our universities internationally. We no longer are sitting in a microcosm. We are part of something bigger and your work is setting the stage. So I just wanted to say thank you and appreciate each one of you being here. And it's good to see faces that I haven't seen in a while as well. <clears throat>
Yeah. Sorry, I keep saying the new one because I still go to the other one that's, you know, the big one, yeah. the other yeah. one. Mm -hmm. I use, well, obviously I don't work up here anymore, so that's why. Mm -hmm. That was closer to my house. Mm -hmm. But for you, it makes sense, probably, because mm -hmm. it's way close for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I don't, I'm not I don't stop and get coffee. Like, yeah. I just use Keurig cups or whatever. Like, I'm yeah. not picky at all, though. I mean, I like a nice coffee, like a boozy coffee. Mm -hmm. Not because I feel like I need it. <laughs> I like the taste. Yeah, like if you like it, then yeah. you go for it. I know, but there was one committee, oh, it was uh, Education Budget Committee, like a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. We were on some break and they wanted to wait. We were really ahead of schedule before OPI stuff started. Mm -hmm. So, and I was staying. So I told Julie, I was like, oh, I'm going to have a coffee. Like, do you want one? It took me 32 minutes to drive, to like go through the drive through And once you're in the drive through there's it's no the change in your mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the old one, you could cut, cut out if you need it. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was glad I didn't like go get in that line. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so funny there. Fun tip. Mm -hmm. No, it's a good idea. Or, yeah. I just don't do it very often. So, right. It's like, you're like, oh, I need to do this. Mm -hmm. I also had some um, cook up my purse. Oh, it's okay. I don't know. Like, it started last night. Oh. I don't know what. I don't know. It's, I don't know. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> I actually, it was like, well, I had to be on Zoom the whole time through my COVID, so I just were laying the whatever topic. I just wanted the coffee. Yeah. The green will thank you. Then I'll have more energy. I did lose my food. Like Hopefully we drink it all today. But like I lost it without a bag. I did have some of yesterday's this morning. Uh, oh god. I did. I did. Did you? <laughs> you? Yeah. I, I sent it home with cold. <laughs> in my you know. And so, you know. That's funny. It's not exactly like wine. It doesn't age well. <laughs> it was still actually I had some yesterday afternoon and it was like still pretty warm. I'm surprised. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys shut the back down? Oh, no, we're still going to have to get it. Um, oh, they had a game. What did he say that? Oh, shooter. I am the best Right, you know. So that's what I love. Right, and not because you can see them in the sky. Well, we'll sign you out there. Very good. Thank you so much for class. Be like, uh, back in the time when, like, what, the summer? Yeah. So thank you. Well, just to ask you. I was not a good stuff. No. I don't know. Why the website or something? Yeah, right. so just, 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 So it's been ridiculous. <laughs> it took four months for us to get our, our marriage license back. What? Yeah. Where did you get married? In Billings. <laughs> and we found out that the guy that like they only have one guy that processes marriage licenses in Yellowstone County. So he and then he went on vacation in the middle of all of it for like a month. <laughs> so it took four months to get our marriage license back. And then it took me like a month to get my social security card. And now I have a I just have to wait for my a license, which of course was a month out. So it's like at the beginning of February. So. I was well my name gets mixed up all the time anyways, which like when it's done, like whatever. But so when it shows up on Zoom and it's like Flynn McCall McCall, and if I don't remember to do that, so I just like all I tweet, I was like, like I need you to change it. To me. Like there, you've got to have a way to do this. On yeah. And they're like, oh, Jesus, like, no. like if I do, I'm like no, I would have done it myself. Yeah. And they're like, well, the ITSC or whatever. There's like a whole thing that has to happen. And, you know, you could go through this whole system and then someone and I was like, 
That's not a good Yeah, and someone got back and was like, oh, just kidding, we changed it. <laughs> like, so, yeah. okay, so <laughs> yeah. I'm just waiting for like my email and all of that stuff because I can't change my name at work until I have a new license. I don't know. So, I know. So my email is interesting. I'll have. So like I know that I've confused people because <laughs> I started introducing myself as Chris and Leverage, but yeah, email. Is. Well, and even like when I started the job, I, was, I really wanted to keep my email because like I'm still doing education stuff. I'm still working with the same people. Like I want my email. Oh my gosh, that was like a great process. Yeah, I don't know about um. Because like sometimes other people um get married and you know you know if you type in her maiden name, it's still populated. Mark. Yeah, that's cool. Um, All right, you guys, I'm going to give you one minute to kind of get organized, push that final send, get out your data, kind of lay that out and your responses to these questions, and we'll begin in one minute. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> and then you have to get them like typed into notes so that you can actually look at it. So, all right. Yeah. Okay. So here we go. We are going into a data talk. Um, and we are going to kind of unpack some of the accreditation that we've had. So I'm gonna kind of force this into this protocol very intentionally for us to kind of follow it, because I think it's really important that um, we tend to, once we see the data, we wanna start talking about implications and solutions to that because we are teachers at heart, right? <laughs> and so what I want us to do is really honor each part of this protocol to just let each of us independently kind of share out what they see before we start thinking about what it means and what to do about it, okay? All right, so the first question in the protocol, what do you see? What are your initial thoughts or reaction? What do these data not provide? So when you share, I think it would be important for you to say, I'm looking at such and such set of data and what I see so that when you bring it up, it gives folks a minute 
a second, if you will, to, to kind of zone in on what you're what you're talking about. Okay. So when you're mentioning the data, if you could kind of tell us where where you're looking at um, and what you're seeing, that would be helpful. Billy. So I think can we bring in the piece of data on graduation rates and dropout rates that just came across from your office? Yes. I think that's very important because it breaks it down to classifications of schools as well. Yep. Hot off the press graduation data and dropout rate data. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, how do we want how do we want to go? Just want to uh, why don't we start with um, Billy? I'm gonna start with you if that's okay. And then I'm gonna come over here to Janelle and Heather, and then I'm gonna jump online to our folks online. Um, Gary had to attend another meeting, but we've got David and Tony and Emily. And then I'm gonna jump over to Dan. Heather, John, and McCall, okay? Again, you're going to strictly stay to what data are you looking at and what do you see? And it's just factual. Okay, Billy, over to you. Well, the variance to standard shows us that there's the library media specialist is a huge need. Um, when I look at the intensive targeted and intensive comprehensive, I noticed that there are a lot of our um, tribal and reservation schools that are on there. On the um, intensive targeted and intensive comprehensive, there's a lot of our, um, there are some of our tribal and reservation schools that are on there, which indicates possible cultural need. Um, and then I think the percentages speak for themselves on the rest of the data on the next two pages. Kind of looked at all the data, I guess, and, and just made some comments, but um, overall I'd say staffing is an issue um, in a lot of the data pieces. Uh, student performance deficiencies have not significantly changed over time, but not meeting um, the standards for other assurance things has increased over time. So like the staffing issues and things like that um, for both schools and advice and deficiency. Um, staffing deficiencies, big increase from 1920 to 2021. Class overload um, had a huge increase. And for the most part, schools meet the standards. Thank you. I think I've got it. So far, I've got from Billy, variance to standards highest is in library media, that in our intensive assistant program, um, our intensive assistants identified are predominantly tribal schools. Um, from Janelle, I have a lot of this highlights staffing issues, but the student proficiency rates have been pretty stable, not a lot of changes there. Um, the changes that we do see in the deviations have come within assurance standards and have increased in in those areas and for the most part schools. Heather, over to you, what do you see? Um, so also the library media um, shortage. And along with that, I think it's interesting that on the um, deficiencies data, um, I see page two, two, is that the one I want? No, it's a different one. Um, yeah, on the deficiencies status category summary, there's four different opportunities for them to have deficiencies just specific to library media. So I just thought that was very interesting um, to look at and consider. Also, um, this data that we're looking at is prior to um, the impacts of COVID. And so I think we have to be thinking about this, the teacher shortages prior to all of that, because now that's exacerbated, I believe. Um, one of the things that I also thought was missing when really looking into this is the school classification size. So whether they're C, B, um, A, or AA, I, would, I think that's really valuable information that is missing from all of these um, reports. 
And also, I think five years is a good snapshot, but I think if we're really going to dig into what is needed, we need a 10 or maybe even a 20 year look back at how, how long have some of these schools had these deficiencies? Because I, I think that is very important information because if, they're, if they've been stuck in this trap, even with support for so long, we really need to consider that because um, that is huge, especially for our low income schools that are perpetually maybe spinning their wheels there. And so that is very valuable information. And I'd like to see that look back over an extended period of time. I think that's missing. Um, and then I also got to wondering about, um, you know, the variances and how schools are kind of going through this because there are a lot of different things that schools could do, but they're still ending up with these deficiencies. And so I would just like more information of why is that? What are they doing? But it's still not enough because I know they're trying to address it. They don't want these deficiencies and, um, they maybe can't help them. And so I think that's important to look at. And then on the um, administration piece, there's no, I would guess, title on that. Um, I just thought it was very interesting that, you know, in 18, 19, 21 superintendents were not licensed. And in 2021, 19 were not endorsed. And those are big jumps in numbers. And so I was curious as to why is, why is that? Um, do, is it people coming from out of state and they don't have the knowledge of they could apply for an internship program or what exactly is happening there? I just thought that was interesting anomalies. Um, and then also I was wondering about um, on the same sheet, the deviations for teacher licensure and assignment. Um, there's non-licensed teacher schools and there's non-licensed teacher teachers. I'd like that to be maybe just clarified a little bit because those numbers are also greatly increased from 1920 to 2021. Um, are those same teachers in those schools? Is that kind of double information? Um, and then again, just a further look back um, for some of that information, especially in regards to the library media specialist. So Heather, just to clarify, That means that of these 103 non-licensed teachers, there were, um, they're not spread across 103 schools. Those 103 live in 69 schools. So some of those 69 schools have more than one. I don't know if that helps. All right, we're gonna go on to online. What do you see? Just straight up, what do you see in the numbers? Uh, let's go to Emily. Sure. Um, so I am not necessarily following the rules, but it was something that I was led to from data that I look at every year, um, just after looking at some of the um, numbers around um, in the advice category or not. But um, one of the things that I, it's like kind of the measure that I am looking at all the time, um, particularly when SBAC comes comes back to us um, is proficiency in math and ELA. Um, and particularly for students, um, free and reduced lunch and native students of all grades. Um, and something that I think is a number that folks that maybe don't know all the time um, because it is a pretty shocking number, um, but consistently since um, with the data that we have, Native students, um, um, nearly 85% of them, 80, if this, um, I think in 18, it was 84.9 and it's continued to go up, but almost 85% of Native students are not proficient in math. And um, almost 71% of free and reduced lunch students are not proficient in math. Um, for ELA, it's 80% um, for Native students and um, 62%, um, I think almost 63% this last go round um, for free and reduced lunch students. Um, and the reason that 
I always look to those is because we know um, that, uh, you know, your, your outcomes in school um, statistically are, are truly directly connected to your life outcomes. Um, and if we want Montana to be a state um, where folks can really thrive, we need to make sure that they're able to access all of um, the resources that they can. And so those are kind of the two core things that I always look at um, and always trouble me, um, but directly connected to, you know, so many other things that we do. And as someone who taught seniors, I always know <laughs> which students, you know, when, especially if they have you know, kids at a young age, you'll see them come up through the schools again and cycles obviously just continue and continue. Thanks, Emily. Over to Tony, what do you see? Hey, good morning, I'm sorry. I I got pulled out of my office there for about a half hour. So I, I, I'm totally not up to speed and I apologize for that. So Tony, we'll come back to you. How's okay. that? Okay, that sounds good. Perfect. David, what do you see? Okay, in the yep, yep, thank you. So so forgive me for, for asking, do I understand that historically in the, in the near past, the, 836 schools in Montana were regular accredited. Is, is, that, is that what the data is showing me? That in the last, I don't know, three or four years, 836 schools, which I guess is all of them, were indeed regular accredited in their status? So David, I would say this, I'm gonna look at the chart. I'm gonna to go to one, you guys, that has, um, am I looking for? I'm looking for the one that has all schools. It's kind of got five bars with a green and orange and a red. Okay, and I'm, on the, uh, I'm on the accreditation data right now. Okay, so what this says is that all basically, you know, all 835, four, six kind of ranges around there, right? Schools are accredited in Montana. Of those 836, let's say, that are accredited. And if we look at the last year, for example, 1920, there were 837 schools. That says that 73% were regular. 1% were regular with a minor deviation. 9% were advice and 17% were deficient. So you're correct in saying 837 were accredited, but not all were accredited at a regular status. 73% were. And when you look at those bars across the years, it's pretty stable, if you will, of the percentage that are in regular, the percentage that are in advice, and then the percentage that's in deficient, at least the last three. Does that help? Okay. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm trying to follow you here on the, on the accreditation data itself. I'm, I'm looking at the uh, chart schools in advice comparison. Is, is that the one I should be looking at? It's, um, Two more pages after that it has a big bold all schools. Okay, schools in deficiency comparison, and then all schools. Yep, that one right there where there's those bars. <clears throat> okay, I got I got you now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see. Yep. Now, so that brings me to uh, another question: the deficiencies of the schools. Does it distinguish between whether they were assurance standards? or student performance? Yes, so when you go back to uh, one one page previous to that one we were just looking at, there's yes. a bar, I mean a line graph that says schools in deficiency comparison. Okay. 
Okay, so this means in 2018, 19, and 20, the total number of schools that were in the deficiency accreditation status, it still means they were accredited, but they were accredited at a deficiency status. There were 142 in 2020. Of those okay. 142, 100 of them were for assurance standards. That's what got them in there versus 29 got in because of student performance. That's that's exactly, and that's that's what I'm saying. It looks like the kiddos are, 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 are not doing, you know, as good as we want, but they're not too bad. It's the other issues, the other indicators of quality schools in Montana that tend to uh, have the, the largest effect on accreditation currently. It's, it's the assurance standards, not necessarily student performance, although student performance could be better. Thank you, David. Okay. That. All right. As assurance standards are the largest, have the largest effect on status rather than performance. All right. So, Dan, we're over to you. What do you see in the data? Well, I just want to ask a follow up with a question, David, actually with you, is that these numbers seem, when you look at all schools, these numbers in deficiency seem pretty similar over, over a five year period. And one would expect that if, if we were effective at improving schools that this would change, right? It just seems like it's always the same. And so roughly between 75 and 78% of the schools are all set. But then roughly around a little less than 20% are always deficient. Or I'm not saying the same schools, because we don't know that, right? But it does, things don't seem to change despite what we're doing. So it's just an observation more than anything else. We keep getting the same results. I'm not sure why. I, I really, what I see is already up on the list, um, the concerns about the percentage of the library shortage in the media and that disproportionate amount, 51 of 56 schools are, um, that I, I went through and did the classification as best as I could. Um, I didn't see Title I status anywhere on this, and I think that that's important, um, especially when we talked yesterday about um, the rate of achievement. Someone had given a great quote and I wish I could find it in my notes and I can't about um, the low income schools and poverty and the impact. Um, I, I don't see that listed anywhere. I am in the advice data. There is a higher percentage of high schools than elementary schools and middle schools. When you look at that, because we have fewer high schools in the, that's, that's why I was asking yesterday, how many high schools do we have? How many middle schools, how many elementary schools? Um, and those numbers look pretty stagnant when you look across it until you compare to the total number of, of schools in the state that we have. Um, I, like David, looked at this graph and the one where it's the schools and advice comparison um, and the three colors. And truly, if we are closing the gap between meeting assurance standards, we should be seeing student improvement go up and student improvement is stagnated. And yet our assurance standards are increasing. And so if truly our assurance standards result in student achievement or performance, those lines should be parallel. Capture before we turn over to John really quick, what we see so far is um, we've talked about um, over here, right? We talked about this variance to standard, the number that are coming for library media, 
the number of schools in intensive assistant percentage wise representing our tribal schools, the ratios of numbers around staffing issues, the student proficiency rate staying the same, no change, um, but we are seeing changes in assurance standards. Schools um, tend to meet the standards overall. Um, schools have an opportunity to get deficiency standards in library in four different ways. Um, we do have to recognize that this data was prior to COVID. And we also need to kind of be thinking about not just the five-year trend, but the 10-year trend of looking at how long have some of these schools stayed in the same status. Um, and if schools could be getting or improving these deficiencies, what's preventing them or getting them in the way since it seems to be same over time. Emily had brought up about our proficiency rates in math and ELA, and that um, in particular for student groups, for American Indian students, 85% not being proficient in math, 80% not being proficient in ELA, for our economically disadvantaged, 80% not proficient in math, 62 in ELA. And so really talking about if these are the proficiency rates, there's a connection that we can, we can uh, uh, you know, connect to, but these rates do impact kind of what you see as the final outcomes uh, for kiddos down the road uh, after uh, like post-secondary uh, schooling. Um, that we do see all 836 schools accredited, but the majority, 75% live in the regular status and have for some time. Um, that the assurance standards seem to be the largest effect on this on the status versus the student performance. Uh, deficiency status stays the same. Things don't change. We're getting the same results. There's a disproportionate amount of uh, library media that we talked about that is leading to the deficiencies. Um, we don't have outlined in here really predominantly kind of this data just kind of talks overall when we look at proficiency rates and it doesn't disaggregate it, if you will, by different student groups. And so when we see those, that final student performance for a school, it's indicating that all, it's all students. And that may not actually be the case because when we hear what Emily's saying, right, these, these, these numbers really need to be disaggregated by things like economic status. Um, advice status, right? So it seems that in some ways, the way we're measuring things for our high schools have more opportunity than our elementary schools to end up in advice or deficiency. Somehow the standards are creating that, if you will, as an outcome, because there's a proportionate number of high schools in this status, yet um, there are way more elementary schools than our high schools. Um, and then Heather just said, if we see assurance standards increasing, shouldn't it be parallel? Because the insurance standards are the input that's supposed to be leading to this output of student performance. And there seems to be a disconnect. And we're not quite sure what that disconnect is. Meaning, if these are intended to be the quality assurances, how are they leading to student performance? Because if student performance is staying the same and the, and the inputs are getting worse, wouldn't we see some kind of impact on it? So then it starts to make us really question what is the relationship between these two standards if one really is the input and one is the output, are these inputs leading to the intended output? And if so, in what way and with whom? In high school, elementary school, and with which students? Okay, John, over to you. What do you see? And then the call. Okay, um, one thing popped out when I started looking at these mm -hmm. uh, from discussions I had with um, some other superintendents in the Western region. There are three schools on here of superintendents that I know personally that have had the same problem that I have had this last year. So, um, and it's a little bit different, but it, it, Julie, you gotta give me the power to be the governor and Elsie, can you do that? Sure. All right, here we go. So. Um, housing affects uh, all of this. And so um, these other three superintendents that I've talked to all can't, they don't have any housing in their, in their communities and they're trying to build on their communities 
and they're 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 looking at actually purchasing more housing. But anything that comes open, their district is trying to purchase, so they have places to put um, new teachers coming in. And so that's why they're on this list. There's three schools like that. Okay, um, we'd be on this list if if we if if we didn't get lucky, you know, and steal from another district. And that's what, unfortunately, that's what's going to start happening. I think. So the question is, do we want to be proactive or reactive? Do we believe the list up there that you have, that we've created right now um, is going to grow over the next 10 years? I believe so. So let's start taking a look at some of the things that other states are doing. And Billy can help me out with this probably a little bit too, with, with how they got people into, into the bush, into Alaska. Okay. And so I would have had my um, college loans paid off if I would have went out and served for three years. Um, in in a uh, Bush district, right? Um, my two cousins from Libby went up to Kotzebue. They're in um, they're in the medical field. They worked out in the medical field for three years, and they had their college um, all paid off. So, this is something I think we need to start talking about: are these positions that are hard to fill positions in some of these communities that we can't get people to? So, one, it's it, it's a huge financial piece. Two, it's housing. Um, so we have people that are there. So if I was if I was the governor, I would start taking a look at look at in incentive programs even more so than what we're doing for people working. We have a federal piece, right? We have a federal piece where you work in Title I schools, you can get some of your loans repaid. But what's Montana doing though? Like how are we out there being proactive to get teachers into our rural settings, especially onto our reservation schools, um, with that? It's going to take pay. It's going to take housing. It's it's going to take a, a big media push to say this is how we're trying to tackle it. Um, we need to be stealing from other states because we're not producing enough teachers within our own programs itself to do this. And and we got to make it equitable to, um, for for people to, to want to come to some of these schools. Like one of them, um, right up the road. Well, quite a ways up the road for me. Um, their, their, their starting salary is still one of the lower starting salaries in the state. And how do we ask people to come um, and pay off a student loan and pay for um, housing that is unbelievable and work, right? So one of the things we're looking at, because we know this is kind of gonna be happening, I actually have um, board members talking about this, is getting away with uh, when, a, when a new teacher comes into our school, how many years of experience do we give them? And we're only gonna give them as many as they have, because that's the way that's the way only we're going to be able to, to fill a lot of our positions is to start being creative with with some of the CBA stuff that we have. That'll help, I think, a little bit with um, getting the right people into the right positions. But again, um, I think this can be solved uh, at least a little bit from from the state level of making education a, um, and being proactive and making education a um, priority to help meet these needs. If not, we can do all the work we want on the variances that we have up here. And I, I think that's part of the uh, part of the good work that we're doing and we need to do that. Um, but in the same sense, we need to, we need to get more people into our state. We need more, more teachers out there and we need more affordable housing. So John, I'm gonna try to summarize up your, your thoughts. So I'm gonna try to clarify. So uh, push back on me if I don't get it correct, okay? So my thinking is what you're alluding to is that when you're looking at assurance standards and you're looking at performance standards, the current staffing or recruitment and retention and the workforce of our teachers right now has a direct impact on the outcomes that we get on assurance standards and these performance standards. Yeah. The question becomes also, is it reciprocal? Are these assurance standards and these student performance standards also having an impact on our ability to be flexible within staffing and budgeting. So it's it's like this chapter doesn't sit in isolation. It's it's this whole thing about quality schools. There's a lot of external forces on it, such as ability even to staff and get teachers in into the positions. Yeah, and, and I know Dan talked about it yesterday a little bit, and so did I about, um, I guess the word's not eroding, but making these uh, more flexible, right, of, of what we're doing. Uh, we can continue to keep making more and more flexible, but 
um, are we hurting the quality of what we're getting into our into our schools? So that needs to be a to me, in my opinion, and um, I would tell Governor this too: is 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 this a priority? Like, do we want the best and the brightest for quality of, of people in our in our schools? What do you see? I had a, I think one of the benefits of going last is to say ditto on a lot of these things. Um, I did want to just um, kind of highlight that all schools piece that we were talking about. Um, and one of the things that was previously said is that every school is um, accredited right now. I think one thing that's missing is to see as part of this graph, have any of them ever lost accreditation in Montana? I think the answer is no. And so I think having that conversation, like, what does it actually really mean if we're not actually, like, right, we're threatening accreditation, I suppose, but, like, are they ever actually going to lose it? So I think that's a good question to ask ourselves as we're continuing this. Um, and I, I think we alluded to this, but that, that all schools graph, again, um, I think it'd be good to see who are those schools in each of those categories. Are they changing? Are they staying in them? Um, and what are things that we can do to maybe support OPI as they're working with these schools. Um, that may be a conversation for later in this discussion too. Okay, so we've had a lot of noticings, right? So the next question is. Oh, sorry, Julie, can I just interrupt to say that Emily added a little uh, extra in a comment about um, the proficiency of free and reduced in math when you were reading it back i just wanted to make sure that it was right okay i think you said 80 but it's 70. okay thank on the yep yep for ela for native students it's 80 percent free and reduced lunch 62 percent almost 63 and then for math native students 85 percent free and reduced lunch um 71 percent thanks sam yep like, um, Absolutely. Billy. So the graduation rates, I think, are important. Yes. Please um, do share. So all student statewide graduation rate in 2021 was 86.13 percent. Um, dropout rate. They did a classification by through MHSA. Double A dropout rate was three percent. A is 22 percent. B is 37 percent. And C was 43%. Yeah. Yep. Double A was 3% dropout. A, 22%. B, 37%. And C, 43%. So, Billy, and of the overall, what was the overall percentage of dropout rate for the whole state? For 2021, 3.75% compared to a previous 2.91. I just wanted that exact number because what that means, guys, just to clarify that a little bit, okay? Thank you for that, Billy, and bringing that back up. So you want your dropout rate to decrease, not increase. That means more kids dropped out in 21 than in 20. Okay, so 3.75% of our students dropped out of high school in 2021. Of that 3.75, who makes up that group, right? Because it's not equally distributed across the different classes of schools. Of that 3.75%, 3% of that comes from our double A, 22 comes from our A, 37 comes from our B and 43 comes from our C. Okay, so that does not mean, I wanna clarify, that does not mean that our C schools had a 43% dropout rate. Right? That's not what that means, okay? It just means that this dropout rate of 3.75, this is where it's coming from. But, but now this is David as a reminder, uh, Keep in mind, Class C schools has already been talked about. We, de we deal with a mathematical handicap. So anything that affects 
any aspect of our student enrollment represents a larger percentage and a larger impact than the more urban districts with more. So if a senior class of 11 has one student that doesn't complete the course, that, that appears much more impactful than the urban district that has a, a similar ratio. Does that make sense? David, I'm wondering though, like it's like the total number of students that dropped out. So if we said we had a hundred students that dropped out of school in 2021 across Montana, that would mean that of these hundred students, three came from a double A, 22 came from an A, 37 came from a B, and 43 came from a C. It's not the percentage based upon uh, enrollment size of the schools, if you will. Okay, I, I understand, I got you, thank you. Yep, yep. But that said, David, we have a lot more C schools than we have AA schools, okay? So that's what you're bringing up matters. That's where that matters. It's not on this, the enrollment size of the school, it's the number of schools. Okay, so yep, we, yep, thank you. We only yep. have what, seven AA schools, districts, right? Eight. Oh, we added Belgrade. That's right. Thank you, guys. So the chances of a student somewhere across Montana are more likely to be attending a C school or a B school than a double. Well, no, that's not true because the majority of our kids are in double A. But anyways, the number of schools across C is bigger. Hey, Julie, the trend is that the smaller the school, the greater the dropout rate. And one would, one would think that this has to do with we, we have these assurances, right, of, of, of programmatic assurances, but equity doesn't necessarily mean equality. And so how are we devoting more assurances to our smaller schools, knowing that it's more of a struggle for them to provide the sort of resource or resources to prevent dropouts, like school counselors, you know, things like that. So. What happens is we, we, we establish a standard and then the small schools have to get variances because they can't do it. And then we see the result of that. There has to be a way to support those schools other than the way we're doing it now. Or we're just gonna get, keep, keep getting the same results. It is, it is. And so, you know, if you took a funding model and you had like a hey, geographic- Tell them, Tony, the school, how are you doing? So you get a greater amount of money because of your isolation factor. That would be that would be helpful. All right. So next question. So we'll just open this up to the whole floor. What does this data tell you? Because we've been talking about this. What does this tell you? What do you want to know more about? We've indicated that we have some more data to bring forward. So thank you. I wonder why. I wonder if. What do these data confirm? Can I can I put down some of my thoughts? So as I said yesterday, I'm a questioner person, so I come up with a lot of questions, but some of my questions were, um, how much of the deficiencies are due to funding issues? How many are labor-related issues? Kind of random, but I know smaller schools have the Montana Small Schools Alliance, but do larger schools have an option similar to that? I don't know, that's my lack of knowledge, but um, could that also help if, if B, C, or if B, um, A could have an opportunity like C schools do for Montana Small Schools Alliance?
and also how what have some schools have found solutions so what are those solutions and can they can they pay them forward maybe to others So this is, this is David with another uh, aggravating question. Is there an opportunity at this time to discuss assurance standards specific to school size? Is, is, is now the time to say, all right, knowing that there are differences, is it just too much bureaucracy to consider assurance standards that are far more relevant to the size of the district? So David, I think that your question is a key question because it does bring up the notion of minimum standard. And the question becomes, are some of these assurance standards minimum standards to everyone? Are some of them actually maximum standards? based upon the school size or the funding or the employee relations component. I don't, how did you phrase that, Heather? So I captured that right. You said educator, the deviations. You said that your second question was, how many of the deviations are a result of? The labor issues. Labor issues, yeah, thank you. Availability of the labor, I guess. I mean, looking a little bit further into the annual accreditation report, like music is a problem area. Music is required of middle schools and high schools. If there's no people around to teach music that are licensed, how are schools supposed to do that? So that, that becomes then that labor piece and the education piece. I mean, we've, we've talked about for several years, you know, teachers need to talk more positively about becoming teachers so we can get more people into the teaching field, but there's all of these barriers in the way um, of that as well. So I think factor. So David, I think Heather's capturing what you're thinking. You guys have similar lines of thinking. I'm making an assumption there, but basically what she's saying is similar to what you're saying because um, these deviations may be occurring in some of our smaller schools because of labor issues of not being able to recruit, for example, a music teacher in a rural small school um, and music is required in your middle school as one of the assurance standards. I, and I'd like to add, it doesn't happen just in small schools. I, I lost two teachers this year um, to Missoula because, you know, I'm class A, right? Because of affordable housing. There were two, like when I bought a, a place in um, Corvallis, um, there were two houses under 300,000, that's it. There's nothing for affordable housing. So it's not just housing itself in some of these community, communities. Sometimes it's, it, it, it's affordable housing too. Talk about Bozeman. You saw the news reports this last um, fall with how many openings they had, right? And so I think it affects all of us. And I think Great Falls has something similar you, you talked about yesterday. Yeah, and I would concur with, with John on that. I think what we see when students go um, to small schools or to small communities to teach and work. It's because they are small school, small community kids going to teach and work, and they're going back for the values that those small schools and small communities bring. They grew up in it. They're, they know that that role they play. So that's part, but we have a teacher shortage nationwide, and it is only going to make our ability to reach the assurance standards much more difficult. What I can tell you is there are districts who are actively going out and recruiting. And when I say active, I mean, we're going after them hard. We're going, we're treating it like a business. And so you wanna to come to Great Falls? Let me show you all the amazing things Great Falls has to offer. Because if you're a young student coming out, not only are my wages a little higher than small schools, but I have all these other things I can offer you as well. So we're trying to show off our communities. Um, I think the state of Montana, and we started that, there's a, um, a website I believe I saw, Teach Montana, that is a wonderful start, but I think we need to collectively start doing that in Montana. Bring them here, and we'll bring them from other states, and 
we'll get them where we want them to be. You know, I, I have something that I just think is a huge irony. You know, in education, we see it as a, as a, the academic skill building, you know, course of study for our students, but, and we promote every other type of job. We do career tech, we um, have agriculture, but we don't promote teaching to our kids. So why are we not building up our own profession before the kids have to decide what a different avenue? It's not, you know, and so I, I find that is a huge flaw in our school system is we spend so much time saying, how about you look at the career tech? You know, how about you look at ag? Why not say, hey, let's look at becoming a teacher. You know what, your senior, junior and senior year, let's work with the universities and let's, let's um, start introducing you to teaching. Why don't we do that to build capacity in our state? Um, so that's one thought for me. Another thing too, is I, I wonder if by trying to so prescriptively define assurance, are we actually, are we hindering it? Are we putting so much on the plate of checklist and saying that these are minimum standards when as educators, when we go into this profession, I would say the greatest majority of us is we don't wanna meet the minimum. We want, I mean, we're in the profession where we strive and push people to their maximums to find what they're really good at, to find those channels. So calling them minimum standards is, if you meet that, that's not, that's not our profession. We want to be above that. And so we spend so much time diving into one of them that we don't have the time to di dive into the others because we're not going to do that to the minimum. So those are a couple of thoughts for me. And what's the minimum standard we expect in proficiency in ELA and math to be regular? What's the percentage? 15. So, okay, I just threw that there. Um, um, real quick, yes, Julie, so um, Educator Rising, which is a CTE pathway identified and recognized by Perkins, um, is so you can recruit teachers, offer pre-teacher education courses within your schools and actively recruit them through that Educator Rising process. And so it's probably, I would say, the least known pathway as far as CTE goes. Um, but you can use Perkins funding and all that other stuff to help support that. And that's an important thing. Um, what we found is we offered um, Educator Rising courses and introduction to education classes in Great Falls. We work closely with um, MSU Northern and three or four years ago, I packed those classes with 20 to 30 kids so I could offer a section. I had four register, four across 3000 students. So I didn't offer the classes last year. And so it's just goes, it goes back in, into how do we build it? We have to build it from the ground up and so, yeah. But I would want you to know, Heather, it works because I'm, I'm the advisor of Ed Rising Collegiate at our college mm -hmm. and uh, our, our uh, president, is a graduate of Great Falls and she was in the advising yep. program there. Yeah. So it works. Make it attractive for kids. I mean, we really do. We're talking about doing some fun things with them and we're gonna see. we'll see, but there's a lot of work to do. So I think um, that you guys are part of this whole thing around, right? The educator workforce is very, very critical. Um, and we know the important work that we have in front of us to be making recommendations about what are the standards? What's the process we should use? But we have to contextualize that. So I think that's important. There are influences on it, right? Um, and so the question became about what, you know, are these um, assurance standards helping us with that or what's happening, right? What's the impact? Because when you look on the chart, you guys, that says it's towards the back, it's the second page towards the back. It's one of the uh, five-year trend ones. It says deviations, teacher licensure, and assignment. So when we look at that, we can go from 17 up to 21, and we just see the facts are more and more non-licensed teachers going from 67 to 88 to 71 to 103 to 184. And is that as a result of what we're talking about? So it's already having an impact. Okay. 
last question for us on that slide really quick. I want to be sure that we've kind of captured our thoughts. Thanks, Eric. So what are the implications? So what? Why does this data matter? And I'm just going to start. I'll give one that even happened to me, and I'll be transparent with you guys this morning, right? Like somewhat in my mind, like when Eric asked, can we have a focus group on library and media specialists, right? What, what was happening for me inside, right? And it was this piece around, it seems to be where we're getting the most deviations. There's four different opportunities to get them. It's a place that they're asking for the most variance of standard. And I'm trying to weigh that in my mind of thinking about if that's all we fix, what does that mean for our kids? And what does that mean for quality schools of how we're measuring it? And so I almost felt like, oh my gosh, don't take me down this rabbit hole, right? Like I just fear and anxiety, I'm just being honest with you, right? Of the implications of saying, we just took this data. And so what's the data telling us we need to fix? And that's all we fixed, would that be enough? And so that's what I was wrestling with this morning. So I turn it over to you guys, your thoughts. What do you think are the implications of this data? What is it? What are the implications for this data on this group, on your work? Well, I just go back to that that data correlation that I looked at. Is really our do the assurance standards that we have impacting instruction and student mastery and achievement in Montana? And if you look just at the data. No, so we're miss we're missing a chunk somewhere, um, and and I don't know what that is. But my concern is as we get more and more unlicensed teachers, we struggle more to that that gap is going to widen more. And um, I'm just I'm really concerned about that piece. So for me, that's the implication: is it just doesn't seem to match up because you would think is strong assurance standards and more schools reach those assurance standards that their performance should be up there and there's a disconnect. So we either have the, the wrong performance tool that we're measuring to match that or we have the wrong standards. I, I think, you know, I, um, I was looking at John Hattie. I don't know if you're familiar with this research or not, but John Hattie has identified like 219 covariance of student learning. And um, probably the most effective are things that skilled teachers can do in the classroom. Mm -hmm. right. and, and a certain level of collective teacher efficacy. So it's the extent of how do these stand, how do these accreditation standards impact teachers in the classroom? That's where we that's what we're gonna make a difference. And if we don't impact that, nothing else will change. So I share your concern of that skilled that you cannot replace a skilled teacher that it isn't like anybody can do this job okay you got to have a skill set to do this well or it won't make any difference you'll sit there and you'll do yabba 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 kids won't learn so that seems to be a waste of time yeah let's let's stick people into into uh legal or the medical field right with with less credentials and see how those patients and those people getting legal advice like that right we couldn't find a cardiac surgeon, so I'm going to do it now. I've seen a couple of YouTube videos. We could probably make it work, right? Definitely want to want to not move that way. Want to do everything we can to not. <laughs> right, but if, but if does having a library media specialist change how a teacher teaches? in the classroom. And, and I think we need to get, I don't know, I, and, and maybe this is just my leadership style, but we always need to go back to those points. Does it impact teachers? Does it impact kids? If it doesn't impact teachers and it doesn't impact kids, why do we waste Montana's time? And we just need to figure out what those baseline, what are, what are our core questions or, or values? And if it, why do we even deal with it if it doesn't? I mean, are they important? Yes, but are they mandates? I don't know. 
I guess it begs that question, but. And it's timeless, Heather, because when we think about 10 years from now, what well, is going to matter 10 years from now? Good teachers, effective teachers, that'll matter 10 years from now. Yeah. Question I have that when I looked at all this is like, we, I agree with everything, but with the powers that be, can we make those changes? I mean, we can make recommendations, but will it make a difference? So is it we're spending our time in things that we really can't change because we are not the final say? And you probably know that. But we have a voice. And I'm here to help you elevate your voice. That's my job. And for you to get out there and elevate other people's voices and bring it back here. And that's why this process is here, right? So it has made changes, right? When we have authentic processes, it can make a difference. I believe that. Um, so I just kind of want to, Heather just brought us to this last point, but she says, does it impact educators? Does it impact student outcomes? Right. And so this afternoon, we're going to go into an activity. We're going to debrief that article. Okay. The one titled an analysis of school quality and accountability rules in Montana. So we're going to debrief that. And we're going to move into another activity of going back into our rules. So we're going to go, again, I'm going to zoom you out, <laughs> taking a look, big scope, right? At the analysis of school quality and thinking about our four pieces on our framework, the standards, the process, the response to that accreditation, whether it's the you know corrective, so what, right? And then the end is around improvement, okay? So we're gonna go zoom big up into this article and then we're gonna go back, zoom back into our arms. And we're gonna take a look at some arms are gonna be put into breakout groups to say, I strongly agree that this arm impacts our educators. I strongly or I di strongly disagree that this arm impacts student outcomes. Okay, so we're going to go a little bit deeper. That's what the afternoon is going to look like. I'm just doing a quality time check here. So I'm looking at right now 1045. And so my thought is to give you time this next 15 minutes to go into that article and read it if you haven't had time or kind of reread some sections if you would like to. Um, just want to confirm, does that work for you guys? Does that work? give you about 15 minutes now of just quiet time to just kind of read. And then lunch will be from 11 to noon, back here at noon, we're gonna debrief this article and then we're gonna dig back into some rule. Okay, thanks guys. Uh, for our online folks, we're going to go, we're going to get the electronic version of the article Julie's referring to, and we'll post that in the chat momentarily. Yeah, oh, and we can email it out too to everyone. Or yeah, yeah, we'll make electronic access to it available in a second.
You guys are free to go at any time. Just come back. <laughs> I'll see you at noon. It's a pretty dense article. It's a good article. Dense, a lot in it.
Okay, we're gonna start in 30 seconds. All right, I thought we would kind of come back into lunch with a quick warm up activity. So if you could get out your calendars while I have you <laughs> and look at April. And let's figure out two days in April where we could come back together here. Um, we would do again consecutive days and we would start at 10 go to five and then start at eight in the morning and leave by two. So looking for two days in April consecutive. Ten, eleven, twelve are not available for Dan and I. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, could we turn around and come right back to hell? We could. We could. We could. <laughs> we could do 13, 14. We're actually doing accreditation process. <laughs> well, and Julie, I know the negotiated rulemaking is meeting the 13th at 3.30. So like you can do your short day the first long day the second. I don't know. It's an option. It's looking 13 is tough for us, you guys. We'll be coming off a pretty big extensive accreditation review out of uh, Missoula, the UM. So, um, so the 14th, 15th, I don't, do you guys do Fridays? <laughs> you can't Thursday? What'd you say, John? I didn't hear you. Can't do Monday. Monday's Easter Monday, the 18th. And it's tax day, just so you guys know. What if, yeah. What if we do the fifth, sixth? I can make that work. I can do that. Somebody want to make a motion? Make the motion April 5th and our next face-to-face -face meeting. Second that. Hey, if we could have a um, anyone that has a no. No on the fifth and sixth. No. Okay. I, we have uh, our, our. Julie, that Monday, the 25th, will be the Chapter 58 public hearing, um, but any other time that week. <clears throat> okay. All right, so we'll keep, hold on a second for the 5th and 6th, but everyone check 26, 27. This will give me an opportunity to give you a lot of homework between then. <laughs> I'd okay. like to make a motion for the 26th and 27th. Yeah. Is there time you could do during that week? That week's out. Okay, so it looks like we might be back to the first week. Does the first week work for you too? Well, we could look at the third week. Looking at the third week, again, 
Janelle said maybe it might, but um, for county soups, but um, third week, 18th through the 22nd. Did we say 14th, 15th was a no-go for somebody? I can't remember now. Would or wouldn't work. Okay, 14th, 15th. What do we think? Okay. So Julie, I move that we um, meet again at the 14th and 15th of April. I'll second it. Any nays? Okay, set April 14th and 15th, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., 8 a.m to 2 p.m. Thank you for taking a moment to do that. Also, as just another housekeeping item, as a reminder on that podium, our non-employee and reimbursement forms for your travel and your um, food and such. So be sure you take that and complete that and submit that to Tristan, okay, via email, okay? Just don't forget that piece. That's kind of one of those things I have to be sure I remember up front. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> okay, so this afternoon, we're gonna dig in. We're gonna do an article debrief. Then we're going to take a time to look at an um, activity around um, kind of what are the essential elements that we should be measuring for a quality school and when we're working in small workout groups. I'll be sure to set up what next steps will be based upon where we land because we had the survey there. So it might be an, a take home activity where we subdivide and each come up with a couple of questions around our framework. Um, because I think that's the easiest piece to shift to an out of, out of box task, if you will, um, or out of meeting task. And then um, we will have public comment from 145 open till two, and then we are complete at two. So we'll wanna be finishing around probably 130 with our two major activities, the article debrief, and then this analysis of rules again, um, probably around one. 30-ish, if you will, so that we have a few minutes to kind of gather up, kind of summarize everything, complete our reflection forms, um, and bring closure to a very thoughtful couple of days. Um, and then our public comment at 145 and departing here at 2. Any questions for me on what the afternoon will look like? Okay, so we're going to go into an article an analysis of school quality and accountability rules in Montana. So I'm gonna give you 10 minutes independently, and I want you to go through and highlight or find quotes or pieces to answer what we call a 4A protocol. Have any of you participated in a 4A protocol before? So there's four A's, there's assumption, agree, argue, and aspire. Okay, so what I want you to do in this 10 minutes is to go through that article and find a place where there's an assumption in this article that is made. That there's a place where you agree with in this article. There's a place that you would like to argue with. Um, and then there's a place where you aspire to. Okay. So I'm going to give you each time to do that, and then we'll share those out. Questions for me on that process. So looking at the clock, this puts us at about 1220, all of us sharing out our four A's. Okay, we'll leave that up there so you remember what the four are.
five minute warning. All right. Eric's going to record for us actually right here up on the slide on the screen, if you will. So um, we'll go ahead and take turns. Um, and what I think we'll do is we'll alternate between somebody on in the room, somebody out of the room, somebody in the room, out of the room, if that's okay with you guys. And then um, 
when you are referencing it, if you could, when you start to say, well, this is what I think is an assumption in the, in the article, if you could actually tell us what page you're looking at um, as you go through them, that would be helpful. Um, and so then you'll go say what that one is, then go to the next one on a, a point that you, um, that you agree with, page number, something that you would like to argue with, and then something you aspire to. Okay, sound good? All right, so we're gonna go in the room first and I'm gonna go with Heather Hoyer. I'm gonna start with you, I'll give you a warning. Okay, and then we'll go online um, to Tony. So Tony, you're new, you're up next. Okay, so Heather, start us off. Sorry. <laughs> Do all four. You get one turn. Uh, my assumption is on page 14, and it is the very last sentence, full sentence of that page. And I, I was surprised this wasn't earlier in the article, but I think it's assuming that most people understand, and it goes back to a conversation Billy and I had at lunch, is that um, much of MCA, which covers accreditation and curriculum, 44 of it, 44% of the code has not been updated since it was originally enacted in 1947. And so we were talking about why some things are driven by law and once, why some things are driven by guidelines. I think it's just, it, they're assuming we know that it's that outdated um, <clears throat> and we don't. Um, my agreement is on page 11. It is in the last paragraph, um, second to the last sentence. And I agree that, oops, sorry wrong page, page 11. Um, it's the one that you read, Julie, was um, if states set ambitious expectations for students and coordinate instructional policies around those expectations, they would also undertake reforms to provide a great deal of freedom to schools in reaching those outcomes, because I believe that that's, it speaks to um, potential flexibility. And so I agree with that. Um, my argument is found in page 19. It is the top bullet. Um, while I think it is noble in statement, I think it's dangerous in assumption. And it's identifying and highlighting schools that currently have regular accreditation status can gain insight about best practices. Because as we've talked, not every school comes to the table with the same set of needs and the same set of resources. And I, I think that that, I don't always agree with that. So if the Level the playing field was completely level, then yes, but um, there's a big difference between what schools can actually afford to provide to students and where they meet students at as well. And then the aspiration is on page 16. And it is um, all of those numbers one through four, and it's the bolded one. Um, I, I think that we should accomplish guaranteeing a basic system of quality schools, that we should comply with state law, guarantee equal educational opportunity, and strongly, strongly, strongly encourage improvement. Did I do that right for you? It's been a while. Since it was a perfect a model. Thank you. All right. All right, we're gonna go online to Tony. Tony, you're up to share with us. All right, good afternoon. Stories. All right. Um, so the first one, the assumption. Um, first thought that came to mind when I when I read over this document is I I wonder if this document or the folks that constructed it are assuming that all Montana districts will continue to have the ability to maintain their current staffing levels into the foreseeable future. Um, that will allow all schools to guarantee a basic system of quality schools and equal educational opportunity. That was the first thought that came to my mind. Um, was, was that their um, working knowledge when they originally drafted the document? Um, I, I had a couple points of agreement on the document. The, the bottom of page 14 addresses a dilemma, um, gave an example of a small school um, facing a challenge between hiring a reading specialist versus a librarian. And it puts a district in a situation where does the district do what's best to meet their student needs 
or do they hire a librarian so that they can check a box off on a report? Um, the other item I agreed with was the, the top of page 19 addresses unnecessary administrative burden um, to reduce the legitimacy of the process. Um, gosh, what am I going there? I got my notes here written. Moving on to the argument, what I would argue is page nine has a chart that lists regular um, advice and deficiency status. Um, there's quite a long list of deficiencies and on a moving forward basis, can Montana schools, specifically small rural districts, can they continue to provide a quality education with perhaps some flexibility on all of those deficiencies that are listed, um, if that makes any sense at all? Um, and then the, the final one, the Aspire, um, on page 17, where it talks about encouraging improvement, um, I, I think all districts should embrace a continuous improvement, um, kind of wherever they're at, um, as far as that goes in the process. So um, any questions, uh, feedback, thoughts, or anything I can clarify with, with what I've gone over? Thank you, Tony. Yeah, no problem. Okay, let's go to Billy. Trying to get all my papers in order. So I would say that my that the assumption um, and also an argument, I guess, is that local school boards, sorry, it's on page 12. Um says the standards of accreditation also hold local school board, local board of trustees responsible for assessing the educational needs of students, the overall effectiveness of programs and for modifying programs accordingly. That's an assumption, I believe. Our trustees are, are volunteers and don't have the same educational background as those of us trained. So I think that's an assumption putting on them that they should know. Um, and also that in the same places, that's my argument a little bit for to why we need to have that place somewhere else um, to ensure that quality is aligned with pedagogy. Um, on page 13, I had the same one was Tony about the librarian versus the reading specialist is that um, I agree that that's a dilemma that all of us Face, and it's a risk that we have to be willing to take and it might result in not being accredited because we have more of a need for a reading specialist than a librarian at that point. Um, aspiration on, number, on page 16 was number four, encouraging improvement. And I would just reword that in my brain as encouraging growth in our systems, just like we do in our students. All right, Emily. All right, I do have a couple things. Um, so um, first, I on the assumptions. Um, this is more of a theme and less of a um, like specific line, but in the um, section. Sorry, I'm jumping around my document on page twelve about mixed messages about authority and local control. I think that this article assumes that um, we take kind of like a layer cake approach to school government, which we do not. Um, the Montana State Constitution views local school boards as akin to more of like the Board of Regents. And there's also conversation of that within the CONCON -Con notes. Um, so I think that's just an important distinction. It's not it's, it, it is not that layer cake view. It is our constitution very much sees local school boards as their role to control and, um, and supervise um, like the Board of Regents. Um, 
Second, for agree, um, I do agree with the discussion within the article about um, the impact of and flexibility provided by HB 351 and 387. Um, I think that some of um, something to keep in mind is um, there are parts of of I would say things that have to do with accreditation and curriculum that may not be um, precisely in chapter seven, but obviously within title 20. Um, I would also for argue, I would argue that some, this is not, it's not in the document, which is, I would argue it should be, is the impact um, and really legacy of the Helena and elementary lawsuits and um, the Columbia Falls lawsuit. Um, that so much impacts all parts of education, including um, quality of education. And um, that's something that I think probably is, is missing in terms of context. Um, I would also argue I, that I had not caught that 44% reference of chapter seven until it was just brought up. So I just went and was looking, and I don't think it's necessarily 44% has it, only 44% has been um, updated or is still consistent, um, because from what I can see from the legislative history, only five of the sections haven't been amended sometime um, since 2000. Um, it looks like section um, like 112 was amended in 1989. Um, and the only two sections I can see that haven't been amended since 1947 are 114 and 115. Um, and then 131 was amended in 1983 and 132 was amended in 1997, but the rest of them were all amended in the 2000s and beyond. Um, so I guess, context around that statistic, I think would be helpful. Not saying that there's not lots of room for improvement, but um, that was pretty striking to me. So I just wanna make sure that we, you know, have, have accurate stats here. Um, and then in terms of aspiring, um, I really appreciated the conversation it, within the document um, about um, access to data and also um, uh, school climate um, and school culture. I think that's one thing that obviously is everyone, not just nationally, but um, internationally struggle to, you know, really define and measure, um, but something that 100% impacts student outcomes. Um, the last thing I just wanted to note, and this doesn't necessarily fall in those four um, questions is there were a number of things within the article that aligned with some of the things that um, the MAR committee had heard in a presentation from the National Center on Education and the Economy. Um, and it was, I, if, if you have not listened to the presentation, I would highly suggest it. It was last month or earlier this month, I guess, last month um, to the MARA committee. And it just really gave a kind of a um, perspective of, you know, we, oftentimes we get stuck in what is happening here in Montana, but it, it very much helped kind of widen folks' perspective of, you know, this is, we need to be considering how our children will be um, impacted, um, not just by national trends, but international trends. And that's it. Emily, can you just tell us again on the Mara presentation, which group you were referencing? Oh, it was the the um, National Center on the on Education and the Economy in CEE. Thank you. Yep. Okay, Dan, over to you. Okay, so my first assumption is um, on page thirteen is a sentence that says. Schools are meant to use needs assessment to develop 
their continuous school improvement plans, CSIP. And the assumption is, is that plans improve schools. And I think that's a large assumption. So um, then on page 18, so just because as Heather said a little while ago, probably yesterday, just because you write it down doesn't make it so. Um, on page 18, I'm, I'm in agreement with what we should be doing in terms of accountability and what we hope to accomplish by guaranteeing a system, basic system of quality. I agree with that. Um, for an argument on page two, So there's a statement. Finally, Montana state performance scores since 2015 have been inconsistent at best, showing no upward trend and little progress in closing achievement gaps for historically underserved student populations. I, I, I'm sorry, but I, I go against this all the time. And that is that this, these, I, a test is not necessarily a gauge, full gauge of student performance and there are other measures of student performance and as long as we lock ourselves down to some more um, some like test-based measures of uh, I, nothing we shouldn't have that but there are other measures and i think we should look at those so um i have a bit of an argument just by saying well that we haven't moved the needle on it on the standardized test hence it's not working and then on page 21 Finally, we aspire. I don't know if it's an aspiration or, or what, but I, I, I think it's kind of interesting thinking about could accreditation functions be met by accrediting a district rather than the school level? And I think that's an interesting notion because most school improvement, I mean, it's hard for a school to work outside of a district in terms of its improvement. And um, in larger, in larger districts, um, you know, I think you can kind of smooth out some of the issues related to accreditation due to size. So uh, it might, it's interesting, we should look at it because I think it might reduce, reduce the number of um, schools in, in jeopardy of losing accreditation, of not being accredited, danger, whatever. Thank you, Dan. Over to David. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I am not prepared to go through all four of them, but if I may, the one that was just mentioned goes back to something that I may have suggested about customizing uh, assurance standards in accordance with school sizes maybe there is something to aspire to on evaluating the school district in some cases vice individual schools that uh, that there might be some opportunities for, and especially in the state of montana the role that the local school boards play in the top to bottom aspects of school operations in many districts maybe it would be more realistic to apply some standards to the district function as a board than the individual schools. But, but to be frank with you, I, I think I'm learning more every time someone else speaks about this. So if I may, without appearing, you know, that I don't want to participate, I would rather just listen. Thanks, David. Heather Jarrett, over to you. Um, so, uh, yeah, okay. Um, one of the assumptions I think is by um, combining the process we have now with ESSA is that it'll be more effective and efficient. I always, like that's always the hope, but in reality, it's very rarely the reality. So I think that's a really big assumption um, that I noticed that's on page, page one. Um, I agree on page 17, um, with an exclamation point that the legislature should find ways to increase funding for schools that have consistently been unable to recruit and retain the right staff to maintain accreditation. 
Absolutely, 100%, maybe even more than that. I agree with that. Um, an argument I can foresee is kind of throughout, but especially on, I think, page 18, um, you know, the difference between the aspirational guidelines and the legality pieces. I think there's a lot of opportunity to argue um, about all of those. And then I found a few um, aspirations. I think on page four, you know, it talks about the opportunity potentially of schools being accredited on a rotating cycle. Um, I think I can see the budgetary um, side of that and the ease of burden on schools and districts. I think that is something that we could aspire to. On page 14, um, having the ability um, to have more laboratory science, time for teachers to engage in activities, support increased graduation rates, all of those things, opportunities to consider different aspects of schooling that aren't in our accreditation standards currently. I think that's something to think about. And that speaks also to the transformational um, and advanced opportunity. I think there's a lot of uh, places we can aspire to in there. Um, oh, sorry, that was on page 14. And then, um, yeah, the rest was just on page 13 with providing more flexibilities to districts and schools. Thanks, Heather. Um, we don't have anyone else online, do we? We'll go to Janelle. I wrote down was that that schools use the needs assessment to develop their continuous school improvement plans. And I think that's a big assumption and, um, and doesn't really do any good and should they. Um, I assume in most of this, it does mention it on page 10, but not very often that school size is not taken into account in almost anything. So um, I assume, I'm assuming that. I agree with, um, on page five, it talks about alternatives to fulfill standards. Um, but is there enough flexibility? And I think that's a whole nother discussion. Um, and um, uh, argue with, uh, there were a couple things. One is equal opportunity. I don't think we necessarily have that. Um, are we using the inputs that matter? It talks about that on page nine, I believe. And then um, on page 14 it talks about employment contracts and standards and should some standards be in employment contracts? And I would argue that no, they probably should not. That's a whole other ball of um, worms that we don't want to probably deal with. And we aspire to, um, obviously, I think we aspire to alignment between federal, state, those kind of things, but I don't know if that's possible. And I think, again, back to equal opportunity, that we should aspire to have equal opportunity between all of our schools, so regardless of the size. Uh, uh, the school size, yeah. And then just the thing about schools use and the um, needs assessment to develop better continuous school improvement plans. Thank you, Janelle. We'll call. Thank you. Um, I also had a lot of the same kind of uh, pieces of the article that stood out to me, but my assumption is on page eight um, under the intensive assistance process. It talks a lot about kind of, you know, schools coming in front of the board um, and how that whole process plays out. And my assumption is that um, goes back to something I talked about earlier today that schools don't typically lose their accreditation. And my assumption is that the board doesn't want to see people lose their accreditation because funding is tied to that. So just trying to think through what that looks like and when people come before the board, what those plans look like. So that was an assumption I had just because I think I have more questions about it than anything. Um, I My agreement is on page two, which seems very simple, but it's the last um, line in that second big paragraph there that while the standards may be necessary to guarantee the basic system of quality education provided by the Montana Constitution, 
it may be worthwhile to delineate which standards are essential for meeting that obligation. And um, I think that's exactly why we're here is to really look at, take a good look at that and determine, you know, what is it that we need for the basic system of quality education. My argument is on page 12, which is um, one that Emily brought up and others um, under the mixed messages section. I think it's worth just noting again um, that, you know, this talks a lot about Montana law being inconsistent with administrative rules. But I think it's also really important to know that before law comes constitution, and that is where the Board of Public Ed, the local Board of Trustees is actually vested in their responsibilities. So I think it's really important that we remember that and that that's why I think parts of law are written that way to give that control to those two bodies. Um, and then just thinking through, you know, how we differentiate those two pieces of um, authority. I think we grapple with that a lot, actually. And then my aspiration was the same as Heather Hoyer on 16. I thought um, each of those um, bullets were really important and um, were things that I think that school districts strive to do. I'm sure OPI strives to do it. We strive to do it at the Board of Public Ed. Um, and just making sure that that's something that we keep in mind as we continue our work. Thanks, McCall. John? All right, my assumption um, went right along with Heather's. It's kind of funny we found the same one. Um, page 17 on funding from the legislature, being able to fund these positions correctly and being able to get more people involved in our in our schools, I think is is that are interested in those positions and doing it correctly, I think is important. Um, I think we need to do that from the state level. And my um, sorry, that's that's an agreement. Yep, you're right. Okay. Uh, my assumption, sorry, um, goes with page eleven. Uh, where we're talking about those 35 schools that are identified for comprehensive support and improvement. Again, we get into the fact that this, this may be a fact, but we're assuming that quality schools comes from this checklist, right? And so we need to be careful, I think, when we look at how we um, support those schools um, going forward. We've had that discussion with several of us have said the same thing. So, um, and then, the next one down is argue. Page 10, first paragraph. Let me read it real quick so I can argue it. Oh, looking at that data. So looking at, um, um, multiple measures, right, uh, of, of student performance. And if we're putting all of our weight, I know you've heard Dan talk about it and others talk about it too, is in that accountability formula, um, how do we determine um, if that's the best indicator of a, of a quality school? And the last one is Aspire. I think that's page... Oh boy. Nine, middle of the page, the input that matters under ESSA. So um, whereas the standards of accreditation define inputs and practices for schools are held accountable, the federal guidelines, the accountability formula for determining school status for support and improvement by weighted heavily towards student performance and growth on annual academic assessments. So we aspire to find the right ways to communicate um, how we wanna hold our kids uh, uh, accountable. And so I think uh, that piece of, of growth is huge. I know you're, they're still gonna want a score that is uh, normative, right? As compared to a growth score. So uh, it brings up the whole piece on, on assessment and what are good indicators for a quality school? Thanks, John. David has a comment in the chat. Um, 
please. Thank you, Tara. No, I think the one online might be different than the printed one. Mm -hmm. So David, this is Julie. Yes, there's definitely a difference between the page numbers on the electronic one we sent you and the printed one that we have here. So there could be a little bit, of, a tad bit of a difference there. Okay. Uh, this, this is, do you want me to share my thoughts? Gary, is that you? Yes, it is. Welcome. Uh, yes, please do. Okay. Uh, well, under assumptions, this might be more than assumption, but all of my my fours are related to page one and page two under the executive summary. And I guess I agree with the assumption of the executive summary that we do not have good alignment between our accreditation process and our accountability uh, measures to assure an efficient and effective quality education. Um, the one thing I agree with is that we, we need to have a thorough review of these standards and all the standards. Um, so I agree with the executive summary on that, that, that we need to recognize the deficiencies we have and take the right measures to address those. I would argue that um, not all stakeholders are sufficiently included. Uh, so I'm all, I've only been involved in Chapter 58 uh, rule negotiation and, and then this, uh, but certainly been involved in many uh, school board meetings and MTSBA meetings, et cetera. So I just feel with this topic, we need to have more on the ground stakeholders involved in a discussion such as this to really finalize and create a good alignment with the standards and our quality education. And the thing that inspires me was actually the same thing that McCall said, which I think was under her agreement. It's uh, at the bottom of page two and it says, while the standards may be necessary to guarantee the basic system of quality education provided by the Montana Constitution, it may be worthwhile to delineate which standards are essential for meeting that obligation. And to me, that aspires me to have sufficient discussion and review and uh, get all the right stakeholders in the room and have a serious in-depth discussion on what is quality education is, and then identify what standards we need to have to accomplish that. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. So that really brings a really good bridge to our final work um, together here. So Gary and McCall had highlighted, they said, hmm, it may be worthwhile to delineate which standards are essential for meeting that obligation. So we're actually going to divide up into groups and Eric's going to take us through this activity. Um, and we're going to get a section of assurance standards and guess what we're going to be looking at. Are they essential <laughs> to measuring the quality of the school? So we're actually going to kind of dive into that, to be honest with you here. Um, and so um, I'm going to turn it over to Eric, which you may want as you're kind of organizing your papers or a little bit. There is a um, two documents that you'll need for this activity. One is you're going to need your rule. So I would get out my um, copy that's really easy to read, if you will. This one, I'd get that out and ready. And this would be in your packet from yesterday, but it is a four column horizontal sheet. And it says guiding questions at the top.
have the two items that Julie referenced in this worksheet. So I would say, so we'll, we'll divide you up into four groups here. Um, and we'll also um, give one through four to our people online, but there's two steps. So the first step is going to be first to take out arm. And so if I'm in, for example, sub chapter seven, I'm going to be looking at 1055-701 to 1055-708. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read those and then I'm going to rate it as one. I strongly disagree to disagree all the way up to five strongly agree that this is assurance standard is essential for measuring the quality of a Montana school. So, for example, if I go to 701, which is about the Board of Trustees. I'm going to start going through this. So I'm going to look at 1055-7011. The local board of trustees shall ensure that the school district complies with all local, state, and federal laws and regulations. And I'm going to ask myself, is that assurance standard essential for measuring the quality of a Montana school? And I'm going to rate it. And I'm going to go through and do that in my group all the way through 708. And then when we get done, based on that, we're going to have a conversation and say, okay, on this sheet here, we're only looking at 701 through 708 if I'm in that group. Now, based on what I've, we've rated and what we're thinking, are there rules that we need to keep that are essential for measuring the quality of a school? Are there rules that maybe we need to remove? Are there rules that we need to modify? Or are there rules that maybe we should add? And so you can have that kind of conversation based upon what your rating is. Questions for me on what the task is before we divide you up. Emily? Yeah, thanks, Julie. Um, I guess I am a little bit hesitant um, to make a specific determination that I know could have larger impacts later on in our conversations. Um, I know just given my, you know, first experience in chapter 58, um, there were some things that were said the first meeting that still, you know, were included at the end, but then there was a discussion of, oh, wait, we, that was just meant to be a discussion, not actually a change. So I feel, I, I, I am just a little bit hesitant to actually say, yes, no, maybe, but would be more comfortable with just a discussion. I know there's a few of us who only got these materials yesterday morning. So 
just voicing that concern of mine um, that I, I probably will not be prepared to say, you know, strongly agree or disagree, but very much open to a discussion. Okay. So I think that's an important point, right? That we as a group have to say, this doesn't mean any final decisions. It's not anything we're taking a vote on at this point. Okay. It does not mean that that's what it's going to be, but it's meant to start to guide us to be thinking about really where are we headed so that we have a sense of when we start looking at these rules, what are we going to need to be able to do? Okay, because we have to have a strong sense of this piece around, are these impacting our, our students? Are they leading to, to the quality education that we want? So Emily, I hear you're maybe like concern and I want to acknowledge it. Um, and I also, at the same time, want to figure out a way for our group to agree, if you will, that we're not committing to anything. That right now, we are just being inquisitive. And that does not mean that we should attach some form of a value statement to that, if you will. So I don't know if anybody in the group um, would like to kind of Clarify your thoughts on that, of how we as a group could approach it to say and address Emily's concern while also being able to continue to be inquisitive about are these rules really essential or not essential so we can start to think about where it does take us or not. Julie, I think that's a good uh, distinction to make that, you know, these conversations that we're having now may not we may not feel the same once we're starting to go through a document and redlining it. Um, obviously, I um, am, could be in a potentially weird position because I'm representing the board. I am not the board, so <laughs> I'm not going to be ultimately voting on these. But um, so just thinking of that, I, I agree with some of the thoughts Emily's making. But I do think that, um, again, as long as we kind of all are under the same understanding of these these decisions we make today may change in the future. Okay, so two parts to the activity. Um, and I think depending on per our discussion, if you feel you need to abstain, although there's no assumption that you're going on the record as endorsing any particular judgment or direction, um, so if you're if you're you and your partners feel comfortable doing so, start with the prioritization, and then using the worksheet, just have a discussion. Um, you can use these guiding questions to help frame that conversation. Um, again, you know this does not commit you to any course of action or any selection. Um, it's just again meant to get you diving into the arms and kind of tee up a discussion for the conversation, tee up the discussions we'll have later. Yes. Well, David has a question. David? Yes. And on our sheets, if we have a sub chapter, so to speak, if I'm looking at 2A, do I want to prioritize A or just 2? So David, which which subchapter are you in? Are For you instance, in I'm looking at 701, yep, okay. Board of Trustees. Okay. And as I work my way down, I see each school district shall make available to the staff and the public. So we're gonna have to talk and prioritize A through J? Yes. Okay, that's what I need to know, thank you. Yep. Does that make sense, you guys? So what David's bringing up, if you look on page 21 on 1055-701, it's just not one. You do one, then you do two. You just don't do two and then skip to three. You would actually look at every subcomponent under it, A, B, C, and see how far we can get, okay? All right, so... Um, I think we have four possible natural groupings, although the folks online might have to. Well, we need to give each of them one, and then they'll do it themselves. And then, okay. Yeah. Okay. So 
let's see, should we have the online folks do the third bullets? So I was thinking that we would need one of them each to do because they can't have a conversation okay. because we're on, okay. on the thing. So I think, um, so David, can you take subchapter seven, 701 through 708? And Gary, will you take 709 to 718? Yeah, okay. I, I'm trying to get I'm trying to get to the document. I, I can't get to it. Okay. Uh, I'll help you out as soon as I get everybody going. Does that sound fair? Okay. Okay. Sure. So um and then 719, 720, and 721 with 801 to 805. Emily, are, are you willing to take a look at those? Yep. Okay. And then um, that leaves Tony. Um, you would be in subchapter nine through 23. Okay, and then for our in-person group, um, let's see, would Heather, Janelle, and Billy be willing to take working back up nine through 23? Since you have three people. <laughs> Uh, that's not that long. Oh, it's not that long. Okay, so they should take they can two take pieces. It, but I'm just sharing with you, it's not that long. Okay, well, since there's more of you, <laughs> uh, let's give you also, so if you could do subchapter nine through 23, but then also uh, 701 to 708. So the first and the last. Okay. Um, McCall, are you willing to participate in this? Okay, so maybe you and John could take the second bullet, 709 to 718. And Heather Hoyer and Dan, would you be willing to take the third bullet? So 719, 720, 721, and then 801 to 805. Okay, I don't, there's a lot of moving parts to this activity. As you can tell, I'm getting myself confused at different points. Um, so you're gonna take the sections we assigned you. You're going to go through and do this prioritization exercise. Again, you're not committing yourself to anything. And then you'll use the discussion questions just to have a general conversation about um, using these questions. And yes, I think, if you want to reorganize here in the room, you can certainly do that. And then let's give you a good, what do you think, Julie, 15, 20, 20 minutes. Okay, so it's almost 110, so around 130-ish or a little bit before. Gary, this is Julie. Can you hear me? Is it David or Gary who has a question? Sorry, you guys. He answered it. Or he asked. Uh, this is Gary. I, I'm, I'm not able to get to that document. I'm trying everything I can try, but I can't get to it. So, Gary, which one are you talking about? The arm or the questions? Uh, well, I think. I think the arm, isn't that the, isn't that the document we're supposed to be reviewing? Okay, would it be helpful to just email it to you? What would be the best way to get it to you? Uh, yeah, email would be great, thanks. Okay. Can you just really quickly, just so that I can catch it fast, can you throw your email in the chat for me? Uh, I can't even open over just a second. Uh, I, I, I can't even open the chat. It's weird. Can you re can you just tell me? Yeah, it's uh, all small case. B is in boy. O, Z is in zebra. P is in Paul. T is in Tom. So it's B O Z P T at Montana spelled out dot net. 
Okay, let me clarify. All lowercase b as in boy, zero, I mean, B, not zero, B O Z <laughs> at Montana.net. <laughs> yeah. Correct. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, I'm going to email you a copy of the arm. Do you want the guided questions as well as I'm as I'm emailing this to you? Sure, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, give me one second. And what 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 sections am I supposed to do again? Let me hold on one second. I'll check. So let's. Gary, it's Julie. 709 <laughs> to 718. And I'm emailing you now. Okay. Thank you very much. Gary, this is Julie. I sent it. Will you please clarify if you got the email?
Sounds good, Gary. Let me know if you need anything else. Will do. Thanks, Julie.
Okay, why don't we just take uh, 30 seconds just to kind of wrap up our final thoughts. <laughs> uh we are we are keeping an eye on the clock because we do want to make sure we end on time for the public comment period so thank you for bearing with us for this um we know there probably was not enough time to get through everything you might have liked to with this. Um, and there's a lot here, but hopefully this again gave us another chance. And you've seen this kind of moving us back and forth between taking a look at the accreditation standards from the 40,000 foot level down to the four foot level. So um, we started at the 40,000 foot level with looking at the article, and now we're back down to the four foot level looking at the actual arm. And we hope that this, again, gives you, gets you more rooted and grounded in the actual arms. Um, at the end of the process, you know, weeks and months from now, we will, among our deliverables, will be in our conceptual memo, some actual specific changes. But before we can start making those, we need to know what's happening, the overall purpose, as well as what's actually in the arms. So that was the intention of this activity to kind of merge those two things. So we've thought at a, at a high level about what goes into a quality school. And then we've looked at the, that's the ma macro level. And now we're also looking at the micro level. So how, how were some choices made about school quality and how did they get implemented into the arm? And are they currently serving our teachers and students and communities? the way that we think best position them for success 10 years from now. So we don't really have that much time. So just to, but to honor the good thinking that you all did, perhaps each pair or trio and everyone online can briefly um, list just a couple things where your conversation focused, uh, what lever points or questions you had as you looked at your chunk or what do you need more information on um what are what do you need from others to be able to continue to dive in and continue to uh interrogate this document and make it and make recommendations for how it can better serve montana so um yeah we'll just do that so please try to keep it brief Summarize as best you can and know that this conversation will continue. So let's see, would our, our trio like to go first? So we had 701 to 708. Didn't quite get through the whole thing, but um, our first discussion on 701, which was um, Board of Trustees, was similar to what Heather was talking to you about is a lot of those things are required policies through our state already. So does is that just a task list that we're we're giving? Um, but you have to have all this done. And does it ensure a quality education for our kids? Um, so we'd like more conversation on that as to why that's in there and if it needs to be or if it's um, could be for certain parts could be taken out. We also talked about most of ours were district superintendent and principal. And so we talked about condensing the the sections, there's 702 and 704 that are both on the district superintendent, licensure and duties is 702, and then assignment is 704. We're wondering if we can condense those into one. So everything for the superintendent is under one heading, but the curriculum coordinator piece, we feel like needs to be brought out of that. And a consideration would be to add in that committee or team 
aspect with some administrative oversight. Um, so then 703 and 705 are the same kind of conversation of condensing the principal licensure and duties with the FTE, but having more discussion on the FTE of principles that's listed in that section. And then we found um, 706, the teacher involvement section, interesting that there's when the teachers are the determiners of quality education, there's two subsections for teachers. Um, and didn't quite get beyond that, I don't think. <laughs> really, thank you. So I think that um, what you're bringing up is really key, right? Like we don't have time right now to kind of go through all of it and have time to really dig in, but it's just a taste of what we're gonna have to do. Right, so we're going to have to get down to our considerations and ultimately be deciding what we're going to do, what we're going to redline, what we're going to keep, what we're going to modify, what we might condense. And maybe we still have a lot of key questions around, should this be in here prior to us even getting to that point? But I do think it gives you guys a sense of in the final pieces of what we got to put forward in our recommendations of what it's going to take to get there. Um, so that you can see that in a very printed way, if you will. So I appreciate you saying there's still things we're thinking about, we're still considering, but it does give you a sense of, oh, if we had to kind of work with these right now, what would we do with them, you know? Great. Um, and David also had that chunk. So David, I'd invite you anything to add. Um, Just to very briefly, I'm looking at 7012 G and I. Equity and uh, equity and something else got my attention. Freedom of academic freedom. I, I I don't understand what the arm wants that to represent. What does that look like? What is an equity policy, and what what is an academic freedom policy? So I would I would want more clarification on that. Great. And then I thought seven oh six just. That's that's seems to me that's automatic. It's a given, and I put that in the category for uh, not essential. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, David. Uh, so McCall and John, and also Gary, uh, you had the chunk from seven hundred nine to seven eighteen. Again, just kind of briefly, what did you talk about? What did you key in on? Um, what do you need more information on? What do you think? Are potential levers for change or yeah. impediments to change? No problem. Um, I'll be quick. The first one we have was 709, which was um, specific to library media. We put that in the rule that needs to be modified. Obviously, we talked a lot about that. We've seen a lot of data that shows that there are challenges. 710, we said same as above. That was the assignment of school counseling staff. Again, we talked about challenges, um, so thought that we should potentially modify. 711 um, is general class size and teacher load. This one seemed it's so small. We thought that could easily be put somewhere else, maybe potentially under 712 and 713, which actually talk about class size. Um, so getting rid of that rule, but combining somewhere else or adding in definitions. 712 was class size for elementary. 713 was class size for high school and middle grades. Um, and we said that we do need to keep the rule because it is essential. Um, we wouldn't change the um, kind of what's written there potentially because of some reasons related to unfunded mandates and making schools potentially have to hire more teachers. There could be school facility issues. So some things that we discussed under that piece. Um, 714 is about professional development. We thought that was important, does maintain school quality and is important for our districts to be able to have some flexibility there. 715 um, was around instructional paraprofessionals. We thought again, that should um, remain. It defines the role between licensed educator and para, which is important. 716 um, was around substitutes. We moved that in a place that we could modify. Um, the training is important, but there is a section in there that talks about specifically like three hours that is needed. Does that actually mean school quality? We're not sure. So we thought that could be a modification. 717 
and 718 are around instruction for Braille students and then also around sign language interpreting. We felt like we didn't have the expertise um, or insight to really answer those questions. So something maybe for um, some experts to be able to um, give more information in those areas rather than us. Great, thank you. And Gary, anything to add to what you just heard? No, I think that uh, was good. I basically agree with that. I had every one of them in the keep and modify section. <clears throat> and my rationale was that I think every one of them needs a close review by experts in those areas and make any modifications necessary to align with quality education to every student. So I think the term every student to me complicates each one of these. And I think that's, in my opinion, that's why they need closer review by the experts. Great, thank you, Gary. Okay, uh, Heather, your partner has uh, departed, but can you kind of briefly yeah, I absolutely can. So we had um, 719 through 21 and then 801 through 805. And much of what we have is reflective of federal law and federal policy. Um, so to just quickly summarize the work that Dr. Lee and I um, discussed or the discussion we had um, for 719, 20 and 21, are they needed? Yes, they're needed. Are they necessarily indicators of, of quality? That's questionable. Um, we think that some of them maybe live in the wrong spot, perhaps, and we're not sure if they were pulled out because of federal mandates that they're reflected in state rule, or if they pulled them out to attach a funding source to them. We just don't know at this point. Um, an example of that is 719. Um, 719 is uh, student protection procedures. It really talks a lot about the orderly operation of school to include bullying, hazing, harassment, that type of stuff. We feel it should live under 801. Um, same with 720, which is the suicide prevention and response versus living independently. You could put that under school climate as well. So short and abbreviate, put it under school climate because it all impacts school climate and the running of your schools. I'm not exactly sure on 721 because that is hazard and emergency plans. And much of what it talks about is assessing potential local hazards within the boundaries of the school district is actually done by other entities outside of the school district, like the county response board and all of those different things. So I'm not sure why that is there. That's a questionable one we have. Should we have safety drills? Absolutely. But are, is it our responsibility to identify the, you know, we have dams in Great Falls. We have a refinery in Great Falls. Everybody knows that, but we don't determine those hazards. Those are done by outside entities. So there may be some things that are missing there or need to be removed. Um, with 802, the opportunity and educational equity really is our general statement um, for our equality statement for this. We think that 802 could, could be pulled and put as the opener to 803, which is learner access, um, because it talks about um, equal access for everybody within that. And then the same thing, we, we, pull, we pulled out gifted and talented and special education. Special education specifically is driven by federal IDEA. We're not sure why that lives separately, but all of that could be put under learner access because it's talking about equal access for all learners. So if you just put that little blurb in our definition, we think we, think we could condense and simplify for schools versus having to look in multiple spots. So that's where we were. Great, thank you. Emily, anything to add to uh, what Heather just shared? Um, just a couple of things and I'll be brief. I agree, I, all these I think we need a legal review for compliance. Um, on 720, the suicide provision response, I think there needs to be inclusion of the um, interdisciplinary child safety team. Um, in 801, which is uh, school climate, I think that there's a lot of potential here, particularly around um, specifying, you know, what a safe um, environment looks like. So socially, emotionally, and physically um, without, I say getting specific, but not obviously 
defining um, what that exactly looks like in any district, but I think that there is some ambiguity within the rule here. Um, the other thing I think that there's an opportunity for um, some language around um, feedback. Um, so schools actually know, you know, how they can improve for students. Um, and then also differentiated um, supports, um, including, you know, social emotional learning, like was discussed yesterday, um, and consistency and expectations. The last one was on 804. And I suspect this is going to probably come up in the next session as well, because it is Senator Solomon's last um, last go around and he has a particular interest in gifted and talented learners um, and one of the things that I think we see a lot is um, if we actually are you know living up to what 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 is required for gifted learners um, but I think another part of that is um, preventing disparities in identifying gifted learners. Um, we always see in gifted education that um, it's typically children that come from higher income and more affluent households. Um, when we know that, you know, that is not, that is, there, there are disparities there. Um, and then also um, multiple measures of identification um, because we know, you know, assessments are not a standardized test is not the only way to identify if a child's gifted in any particular content or um or interest and that's it and i am going to say i have to jump i have a two o'clock meeting i have to run to but really appreciate the time and very much looking forward to the next one thank you emily we really appreciate that you pivoted and joined us um, so quickly and yeah. we appreciate it and look forward to seeing you as well soon Thanks. Uh, Tony, maybe we'll give you the last word. Um, you, as well as Heather and Janelle and Tony, looked at uh, 9 through 23. I think in the interest of time, though, we, we want to kind of wrap this up. So we'll let you uh, briefly state kind of what you looked at as you looked at that chunk. Yeah, let me let me defer to, to Heather, Janelle, and, and Billy. I, I was out for about 20 minutes, so I, I, I'm not up to speed right now. I'll be better at the next meeting when I'm there in person without just, you know, other things going. Okay. I'm seeing some head shakes here from our dynamic trio. So possibly something will pick up at our next uh, meeting. So awesome. thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Sorry we rushed you with this. Clearly this activity okay. needed some more time, but um, appreciate all that you were able to distill and discuss in a very short period of time. No problem. Happy to help. Okay, I just want to do a double check. We just looked, Tara and I, is there anyone that is online as an attendee that does want to make any public comment before we move to closing out our session? Yeah, are they asking? Okay. All right. Um, maybe before that. All right. So a couple of things uh, to just really close out. Um, so what I'm going to do, you guys, is uh, back to that slide, please, really quick. Um, I'm going to put together some questions that are possible within these categories. Okay. So I'm going to send them out to you and say, which of these questions, of these, you know, nine questions, <laughs> which three do you think we should ask about for essential elements of a quality school? And is there another one that you would want us to consider? So it's almost like a voting process, if you will, that you could be able to do to say, I'd like to see this question on the survey. These would be the three I'd like to see for the process. These are the three I'd like to see about continuous improvement, okay? Because I do wanna get out a survey here in the beginning of February to start getting our stakeholders input. But before I do that, I wanna send you a draft survey and um, have you guys give feedback on what are those final questions? Will that work for you? Okay, so our next meeting will be virtual Tuesday, February 8th from 11 a.m. 
to 1 p.m. I will be sending you on Monday. Can you guys believe January 31st is Monday? An inbox task for you to complete before we meet on February 8th. So you'll have to kind of sort through and say on a survey, I'll get that to you, but I probably won't get that to you on the 31st, okay? But on the 31st, I'm gonna have you reach out to some stakeholders and get inquisitive and do a little like, um, if you will, interview, okay? Just to have some questions to say. And so it might be a student, it might be a family member, it might be a board of trustees, it might be um, somebody who represents an, uh, a superintendent role, it could be a, a tribal councilman, be a variety of people, okay? But I want you to reach out to at least three different voices and do somewhat of a quick little interview about the accreditation process, about standards of quality, about kind of what's going on with it. And so I would challenge you guys, as you leave here today, you're going to get in your car, you're probably going to be catching up and reflecting on one, what happened here the last two days, but also where you're headed and what's in front of you. As you go, Stay really inquisitive. Be really curious right now, right? Try to really be thinking about, hmm, I wonder what does this mean, right? And so if you're out there and having those conversations, dig deep with people. So why do you think that, right? Tell me more about that. Um, and I say that because I think we're charged with a lot of really important pieces to be thinking about. And as we worked on just today, you got a taste of what it's going to mean when it comes to redlining and providing rationales for why you're making the suggestions you are to these rules. And so in order to do that, you really want to be thoughtful and you want to have some good information and some good data. It also looks like I'm going to owe you some data because Heather's brought up some other things saying, I want to know a little bit more about you know, schools that have stayed in certain statuses for a long period over time. So I just want to close up and just say thanks. It's been really good. A lot of good thinking. We've gotten down to some really good places. Um, and I think you're going to leave more informed. I think you're going to leave more inquisitive. And I think you're going to leave even more empowered to be thinking about what this chapter means overall and in the recommendations and revisions that we'll make to the negotiated rule committee. Okay. So there's a feedback form. Please be sure you complete that, put that on the podium for me. Anticipate an email from me on Monday of an activity and another email about the survey. Thanks you guys. Yeah, it's about school improvement. I take it, I'm going to, I did have it on there for you to read. Yeah. It is your reading for next time. I'll list that on the homework for you as well. Yep. So you're going to have basically three things to, to do before we get back together, but that's to read that article on school improvement that's in your folder. Thank you, Heather, for that reminder. And then we'll do a little bit of soft interviewing out there, getting some touch points, and then finalizing up our survey. 